The bar for the Fed to start to cut is largely from the inflation front, just showing continued moderation. Rate cuts are still very much in the picture. The market's pricing in the summer, and I think that's quite reasonable. I think they've got room to be very, very patient. It is very likely that you could see these rate cuts get pushed back. There is a cyclical recovery that's brewing in this economy, which may not support that May or June cut. The baseline remains two to three cuts this year starting in June. Hopefully now we'll have less chatter about either a hike or no hikes this year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. We've got to stop changing the clocks. Don't you agree? Oh, gosh. It's like the you weekend really never happened. This? No, I, I do. I think there is no reason for Monday it. morning, Bramo, this is what everyone is feeling. Stateside. Horrendous. There is no reason <laughs> to do daylight savings time. I looked up every reason. It has been proven to be incorrect. It doesn't have any energy savings. And the only reason why is because people want the romance of long winter, uh, long summer uh, summer vacations, long summer evenings, and barbecues. The barbecue I knew lobby. that out of everything, this was going to be the one thing to wind you up. Not jobs, not the Fed, not markets, not CPI. <laughs> that predictable. I Changing the clocks. Last night. Well, I mean, don't you feel the same? I feel exactly the same. Uh-huh. Let's get your week started. <laughs> Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures negative by 0.1 on the S&P 500. Good news is apparently good news. Bad news is good news. How about no news is good news? And really, last week was a no news week. The absence of blowout numbers last week, Bramo, I think that is where it's at. It should be good news, and it was good news for the bond market. Is it good news, though, for the duration of a stock market rally that's showing some signs of maybe the leadership getting a little tired? And that's what I think people are focused on. Are some of the volatility moves that we've seen in the likes of NVIDIA kind of leading to this feeling that maybe the Magnificent Seven aren't so magnificent? Let's get to the NVIDIA check early on. In the pre-market, we are positive by 2.2%. On Friday, this stock was all over the place. So at one point, it was positive 5%, closed lower by 5.5%. I think we were on a six-day winning streak going into that up by 19 percentage points on NVIDIA. Friday's session was kind of odd, given this move in this stock. Given the fact that you had $250 billion of market valuation that you lost at the end of the day after this wild ride, understandably, it's already up dramatically and it's up something like 80-something percent so far this year. So no one's crying for NVIDIA. But it raises this question about whether this volatility means that things are topping out. And I know that everyone's saying, OK, you've called topping out many times before. Sure. But a lot of people are saying that notes over the weekend. We've got a week full of economic data this week. Lisa's going to go through the calendar in just a moment. We are building on payrolls from Friday, looking ahead to CPI and retail sales. The reaction so far, AMH, from Deutsche Bank, the song remains the same. Alarian telling us on Friday it was an ambiguous jobs report. Bank of America resilience, not re-acceleration. I think that's a key point for this Federal Reserve going into next week. And we'll catch up with B of A a little bit later. Absolutely. And when you're looking at what the Biden administration is going to be touting, you say they have their budget report, Jonathan. This is just basically, uh, it's not like worth the paper it's written on, given the fact that it's not policies that the president can easily enact. It's ambitions. But what I found so interesting over the weekend, when you're looking at the jobs and also we're waiting for that inflation print, President Biden was signaling a note to the Fed. Because when he spoke at a campaign event Friday evening, he said, I can guarantee it, but I bet you, you bet you those rates are coming down more. That little outfit that sets interest rates, it's going to come down. He doesn't like to insert himself. He says the Fed is independent. But we saw him do this again when it was a prior jobs report last year. Yeah, I'm not sure when the last time the Federal Reserve was referred to that little outfit that um, sets interest (laughs) rates. The latest poll out from the Financial Times and the Ross School of business over at the University of Michigan, I think spelling trouble for Biden, and two things stand out. Americans' assessment of the economy, actually better since November. The approval of Biden's handling of the economy, Lisa, absolutely flatlining over the same period. So that enthusiasm for the economy that's slowly picking up, not translating into better polling for the president. The actual numbers are kind of shocking, given the fact that his approval rating is 36 percent for his handling of the economy. And yet almost half of U.S. voters now say they're living comfortably or able to, quote, meet expenses with a little left over. So the inflation shock is ebbing. But the shock for uh, Biden's ratings, not so much. We see this continuously in polls. And we also see it in the University of Michigan survey in January. We're going to get that as well and update this this week. Americans are starting to feel a little bit better about their finances. They're starting to feel better about the overall economy. But they're not giving the credit 
to Biden. And this is the gap he needs to overcome, Jonathan, ahead of the November election. Let's start this morning with some price action for you from New York. Equity futures negative by 0.15 percent on the S&P 500. Equity is actually coming off the back of a week of losses after Friday's price action. Really muted marginal stuff, though. We were down about a quarter of 1 percent on the S&P. No drama, Bramo. I know. But Yields it's unchanged on a 10 year. 4.0672 percent. We have seen a move lower in yields, both on the two year and the 10-year, Lisa, through last week. And that's really the key question is whether you're going to see that continue this week when you could potentially get an upside surprise. When you get CPI tomorrow, PPI on Thursday, as well as retail sales, initial jobless claims. And of course, on Friday, we do get University of Michigan sentiment survey. But to me, the real question is going to be how much oil prices are going to really influence PPI. And then, of course, on the heels of all of that, just in case you were wondering, there are a host of auctions, bond auctions, at a time where have P perhaps some of these yields gotten too low. Barclays is saying short the 10-year. We've got three-year notes being auctioned today. We've got 10-year notes being auctioned tomorrow. And $22 billion of 30-year bonds auctioned off on Wednesday. Tons of supply coming through the week. Just to bring you the estimates of that CPI print, 0.3% month over month, stripping out food and energy compared to the previous month of 0.4. Coming up this hour, Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon looking ahead to this week's inflation data. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy as Biden warns Israel not to invade Rafa and Andrew Honhorst of City on on the Fed's path forward. We begin this morning with our top story. A big week ahead for global markets going into next week's Fed decision. Investors eyeing tomorrow's CPI report and retail sales just a few days later. Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon writing, quote, our call for a March cut and then another in May will probably prove too dovish. And we acknowledge that. It's June meeting that will likely offer the FOMC its first chance to reduce the federal funds rate. Jeff, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now for more. Jeff, great to catch up with you, sir. Chairman Powell says he needs a little Likewise. bit more evidence. Is that one inflation print, two inflation prints, or three? Mm -hmm. I think he's going to keep that quite close um, to his um, chest, um, but probably at least two more yeah, at that point. We need um, not just to hit expectations, but potentially in you know, a surprise um, to the downside a bit. And as stated, it probably started the year a bit too dovish you know, and expecting these uh, downside surprises to come off earlier than expected. Uh, but Let's make it clear, still we will get cuts this year. This recent talk about oh, no landing, no cuts, uh, we think the market is going to start pricing that out at the very least. Just probably no cuts next week, Jeff, but we will get a new set of outlook in the summary of economic projections. All the policymakers are going to put in where they think Fed rates will be, GDP, growth, unemployment, all of that bad stuff, CPI. Jeff, <laughs> when you plug in those expectations mm -hmm. next week, will they look any different to where they were back in December? I don't think they will be that different. It's really about the guidance. Uh, and I think you know, Powell and uh, all the um, other, well, most of the other um, FMC members, what they need to do is, uh, you know, not what several ECB hawks are saying is we need to confirm, the data needs to confirm we get to 2% or lower before we can cut rates. Because I think that is the definition of getting behind the curve. You need to get ahead of disinflation, leave everything on the table. So this means from Q2 onwards, every meeting will be a live meeting. Let's make that clear as well. OK, Jeff, a lot of people well, perhaps you can take the no rate cut people out of the equation because you started by saying they're being a little ridiculous. But moving forward, it does seem like there are fewer rate cuts being priced into the U.S. than Europe. And I don't understand why the euro has remained so resilient and the dollar hasn't strengthened even more considering the economic data and the rate cut outlook. What's your take? I totally agree. And I think markets are just uh, whether it's a uh, whether it's a positioning issue and just worried that the market is still overextended itself in terms of dollar holdings. Uh, but I think there will be a point of reckoning you know, with the ECB acknowledging that the European economy you know, faces severe issues with regards to manufacturing demand. If I just strip uh, uh, the demand in the eurozone, looking at imports, for example, whether you look at the material side of things uh, or the consumer goods versus manufacturing goods, it's all contracting double digit contraction. So that is extremely worrying. And I think the ECB, especially the hawkish elements, need to get on board with that and at the very least acknowledge the euro is totally misaligned with where the economy is right now. So what would be more aligned, Jeff? Well, I'm still holding on to my view uh, that at some point this year we're going to get parity in euro dollar. There will be that point where there will be a total revision of their expectations for rate cuts. And if you compare it with the Fed, for example, sure, the Fed may start cutting a bit later, but the pace will be moderate, maybe one per quarter. Uh, but we're going to be looking at consecutive 25 basis point moves, at least 100, if not 125 basis points for the ECB for the rest of the year. And I think that's when the gaps are really going to start to open up so and Jeff drive euro lower as well. 
Bob. To some degree, we have started to price this in fixed income. Yet to Lisa's point, we haven't seen it push through the FX market in, this mm -hmm. in a strong way, in a way maybe that you would expect, Jeff. And I guess Lisa's asking, why hasn't that happened? So I would go back to the dollar positioning view. I go back to my market positioning as a barbell approach. Like on the cash side, US real rates and nominal rates are relatively high. So for your risk-free assets, you own the dollar. For your risk on assets, you own US equities. There's nothing in between and people are worried about that. So as a hedge almost against that overpositioning in the US, you want to own some euros, but at this point it is the wrong currency, it's the wrong asset to own. Given what's going on with the, uh, with the BOJ, with Japan right now, maybe it's time to start looking further east and maybe look at Asia again. All right. Talking about what's going on with Bank of Japan, we can't let that lie because we did see uh, that the recession that was almost priced in was priced out with the GDP coming in and revised at a positive 0.4 percent over in Japan. Do you think that basically this is basically a verdict on negative rate policies that they are going to successfully be able to exit later this month and that March really is the time for the Bank of Japan? Uh, well, March is certainly a live meeting, and I think they're looking at the uh, GDP data, and also they are looking at the underlying data in terms of wages. We know it's been the spring wage round, and they're definitely collecting all the intel um, from Japanese companies and seeing upside surprises to internal company wage settlements, and they know they need to act. They need to flip expectations at the very least. Now, the, mar the challenge of the market right now is we've priced about four big figures lower in dollar yen from 150 down to 146. Is there scope for more? Uh, I have a feeling the market still positioned to, okay, buy the rumor, sell the fact, and then see whether the BOJ can get to surprise the hawkish side. The bar has just been raised for that. There's no longer the surprise element, but let's not rule that out either heading into the March meeting. Jeff, I'm wondering if the challenge for the market is actually in Japanese equities off the back of what you think might happen on dollar yen. We've just had a fifth, fifth straight day of yen strength. And in the Nikkei 225, one of the worst days so far this year. Jeff, what's the relationship going to be? I think so far this year, we've learned that you don't need a ton of yen weakness to get the Nikkei 225 to appreciate. What I'm trying to figure out is what happens if you get a severe bout of yen strength, a move down from 150 to 140, 130, 120. I don't know. But a lot of people are lining up to be long Japanese equities over the last six months. And I think they're all asking the same question. What happens? Well, where is dollar yen fair value? Right? And if you look at the hedging levels for Japanese auto manufacturers from uh, way gone by, they were looking at between 100 and 110, right? So, which means for Japanese industry as a whole, at those levels, they probably can still remain profitable. What are the hedge ratios, for example? But basically, my rule of thumb would be you have a number in mind, and because of the internal hedging strategies, you have to go below those fair value numbers before uh, the earnings really start to become, the yen becomes a headwind to earnings. So, I really wouldn't worry about earnings translation again at least for the next 20 big figures profits will be good jeff but what will inter international investors be willing to pay for them that's what i'm trying to figure well, out how, rea how re mm -hmm. reactive will they be to seeing a japanese yen appreciate mm -hmm. in the fashion that maybe we mm -hmm. should be anticipating Right. So there, it's about pace as much as levels. If you told uh, the uh, earnings estimates uh, that we're going to be at 130 by next quarter, then that's talking a serious adjustment. But if it's going to be a gradual move convergence to fair value over the course of, say, 12 to 18 months, more in line with where, let's say, implied volatility is hinting at right now, I think that can be absorbed quite um, easily. So manage the pace rather than the level. Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon. Jeff, thank you. A lot of people, favourite region, Bramo, outside the United States, it's Japan. Japanese equities pulling back a little bit today, but still up, up on the year by 16%. It's such a complicated question, and it's such a good question about what happens if they do exit their negative rate policies, what that does to equities. Because on one hand, you would think that this actually draws more capital into Japan, which might be a positive. On the other hand, it's a real problem if you want a discount, and a discounted purchase was essentially what people were doing. The other aspect is the Bank of Japan and their balance sheet. What happens to the ETFs they've been purchasing yeah. and all of the uh, other types of stimulus? Massive influence, not just in the bond market, over the BOJ in stocks as well. Equity futures right now on the S&P, negative by 0.16% on the S&P 500. Up next on this program, Biden's red line for Netanyahu. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons, but there's red lines that if he crosses and they cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. That conversation coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning.
Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Equity futures on the S&P 500 pulling back this morning after a week of losses last week. We're down about 0.2% on the S&P. Yields basically unchanged on a 10-year, 4.07%. And in the FX market going absolutely nowhere. The euro against the dollar, 109.38. Under Savannah's this morning, Biden's red line for Netanyahu. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. It's the latest this morning. President Biden warning Israel against an attack on the Gaza city of Rafah. Ceasefire talks with Hamas remain deadlocked as Muslims enter the holy month of Ramadan. Terry Haynes of Pangaea Policy joins us now for more. Terry, wonderful to have you with us this Monday morning. I'm trying to work out if there's a real division between these two leaders or if this is just a convenient media narrative for the president given the domestic politics here in the U.S. Uh, I'm with the second, John. I, I think what you have here is a, a situation where uh, the president's doing his best to uh, to operate a straddle, uh, and uh, you know it's not uh, in the end it's not really pleasing anybody. First and secondly, I you know I think I'd look at it from the Israelis' uh, point of view as well. Uh, the president's foreign policy abroad, even with allies, is not being greeted as a, uh, a paragon of strength or consistency, uh, going back to the Afghanistan withdrawal. And, uh, you know, so there's this fiction being generated in the United States that uh, the United States can have a, a hand in, in the Israeli response, uh, and that's been proven false over the last 150 days. So uh, I think what you've got here with the president is a much more political uh, uh, line here than anything else. Well, this time last week, Biden was hopeful we would have seen a ceasefire. We are now into the holy month of Ramadan. How much strain is not having a ceasefire going to cause within his Democratic base? Uh, it'll cause a uh, continued uh, uh, strain throughout. And, you know, since this uh, this war is not going to end quickly and the, the problems caused by it are not going to go away quickly as a result of it, there will be a continued strain. You know, and I'd remind markets as well that uh, – uh, the president's predictive powers, uh, whether it be on uh, ceasefires or uh, or, or uh, rate cuts uh, or a lot of other things, hasn't been really good uh, recently. I think a lot of this stuff is aspirational. And uh, because it's aspirational and hopeful, uh, I think people should not be taking it to the bank. We started off the show talking about Biden's poll numbers, uh, Terry, and today he's going to have a lot of campaign speak when he releases his budget. But the polling numbers show that people are starting to feel better about their personal finances, the economy, but are not giving Biden the credit. Does the timeline help him? Is it on his side ahead of November? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, the good news here is we've, uh, Biden's got uh, eight more months uh, before the election. The bad news is that the rest of us have eight more months before the election. So, uh, you know, but what you've got is you've got a, a narrative uh, with time to uh, with time to adhere and time to sink in. So, yeah, I think that on balance, that is good news for him. You write in your note today, it period doesn't period mean period anything period when it comes to the budget. Do you are you prepared to learn anything when he releases this budget? Um, I'm prepared to learn what his political priorities are, and that's about it. Um, one other thing that I'd said uh, in the in the note yesterday was, you know, if you don't believe me that the budget doesn't matter, uh, look at our current uh, wrangling around about spending bills. What matters is appropriations. What matters is spending bills. The budget is meant to be a broad, top line, aspirational goal uh, to to try to figure out what spending should be. But in the end, you know, nobody's ever going to be able to tell you in Washington. I mean, there are there are a few uh, all, always who who can do this, but nobody else really can. What the what the relationship is between a budget priority and what's actually happening on the ground on spending. Defense is a perfect example of that. Biden, uh, according to press reports, will say he wants to increase defense spending 1%. He said something similar last year, and Congress essentially bigfooted him and raised defense more than Biden wanted it. Same thing will happen this year. That's the reason why a lot of people are looking beyond the budget. A lot of people are not paying attention to it, to it just like yourself. And they're paying attention to uh, things like the potential TikTok ban uh, that has been proposed. President Biden says that he will sign it. And yet Bloomberg Intelligence thinks that the Republican administration or a Republican administration would be more likely to ban it than the current one. Do you agree? 
Uh, no, I don't agree with respect to your folks. Uh, I think what what matters here the most is how the goal gets done. You know, when you've got uh, bipartisan uh, agreement in Congress with a 50 to nothing uh vote in a committee. Uh, and more importantly, you've had uh, Senate Intel Chair Mark Warner, who's uh, very respected and you know nobody's countermanding him on this, saying TikTok itself is a national security threat. What you've got here is a world in which something has to be done sooner rather than later. And, you know, I remember you and I talking about this at this time last year. And, uh, you know, I think the pressures to do something before the election, frankly, are going to be uh, are going to be overwhelming. And TikTok hasn't covered itself in glory. They continue to uh, make this thing worse on themselves. Terry, the former president's got form. He can blow up deals before they happen. He's against this for some reason. And Terry, maybe you can explain that. Does he have the potential, the power to blow this up too? Uh, he has some potential to do it. I think, uh, uh, you know, today I would say that the uh, the better half of the argument is uh, is the national security issues. But, um, you know, the, the president's not going to cover himself in glory on this. And what you've got is a situation also where, uh, where the interesting part about this is you've got not only uh, the former president involved in this, you've also got, uh, you know, major Republican Party backers like the Club for Growth involved and some of its its major backers involved. Uh, there's a uh, little bit of a feedback loop here who has that, that has the potential to embarrass a lot of people uh, if, if for some reason, Republicans in Congress take the view that uh, they shouldn't be uh, doing something about TikTok. If it passes in the House, do you see Senator Schumer putting it on the floor in the Senate? Um, yeah, I think he'll, he'll probably have to do something. But well, the first thing he'll do is engage in negotiations uh, and probably appoint uh, Senator Warner of Virginia to do this, engage in negotiations to try to find a bipartisan solution. One thing that Senator Warner has said, for example, is he's all for you know, banning TikTok, but at the same time, focusing on a single app he thinks may present some constitutional problems. So the, the question of how uh, is going to take over in the Senate before actually putting it on the floor, I think. Terry what we really want to know is not about TikTok. It's not about the election. It's about when are they going to ban daylight savings time? Why have they not taken it away, given the fact that everyone hates it? Why? Uh, you know, I know my limits, and this is definitely uh, one of them. It's, uh, yeah, it's inexplicable, isn't it? But I do enjoy the dark. Terry, thank you, sir. <laughs> I don't share that view. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. Thank you, sir. Down in Washington, D.C. You can see what Bramo's fired up about today. Let's talk about TikTok just briefly. Look, there's two issues here. One is about the control and ownership of U.S. data. The second is basically rotting the minds of American children, and children worldwide. And there is this... I guess pushback that if we're not solving everything, we shouldn't do anything on Capitol Hill. And that's some pushback, AMH, that I think a lot of people don't share. Well, I think what was astonishing was Trump's reversal on this, coming out on truth, saying he's not so sure. It comes at a time when after he met with uh, the Club for Growth group, Jeff Yass is a huge donor for, on the sidelines for Trump at the moment. If he gets involved, is that why potentially President Trump is now saying, I'm not so quite sure about TikTok. He has a more than $30 billion stake in the company. I think we've all forgotten what happened in the summer of 2020. Just totally forgot about it, that there was a deal struck between ByteDance and Oracle and Walmart back in the summer of 2020. And then, Bramo, it just, like, disappeared. No one talked about it in the months afterwards. The president left the White House, Biden came in, and didn't come back up again. You know, you reminded me about that this morning because Oracle is reporting earnings after the bell. I hadn't even remembered it. And I went back and looked at it and thought, yeah, why is that? No one talked about that. There was a deal. Who pushed back? What happened here? What's the anatomy of the failure? You talk about, you know, the two things, both national security and the rotting of the minds. There are a lot of things that rot the minds of our children. I can attest to that personally. If they really have national security concerns, though, that's something that they should emphasize and they can't really ignore if that's really their main concern. And if this is all about funding and lobbying, then that's just another reason to be despised by what happens down in Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, and if it's about people wanting to, uh, you know, cater to the youth vote, that's the other thing. I mean, uh, how do you cater to the youth vote? It's slightly odd, isn't it, that the president sits there and says, you know, if they, they pass it, I'll sign it, as his campaign gets TikTok ready. Yeah, yeah. I, <sighs> How do you feel anyway, about this? Anyway, I think everyone knows. Equity futures on the S&P 500 down by a quarter of 1%. Up next, we'll look at some data out of China and why the biggest data point of the week might not be CPI Tuesday, and it might actually be coming on Friday in a different country.
Pulling back from all-time highs in Friday's session, starting the week just south of those levels. We're negative by a quarter of 1% on the S&P. We're down a quarter of 1% on the Nasdaq 100 as well. Wild session Friday for NVIDIA. NVIDIA this morning, just about positive in the pre-market after closing Friday down by 5.5%. We're positive by a little more than one full percentage point. That's the equity market story. Here's the bond market picture for you. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Let's sit on the two-year upper basis point, 448.79 on a two-year yield. Instead of reinforcing the strength of the January data, I think the payrolls report just introducing an even bigger question mark, Lisa, over it and unlocking some enthusiasm to buy bonds again and driving yields lower through the week. Downward revisions. A lot of people are focused on that. The fact that uh, the wage increase was lower than expected. The unemployment rate rose to 3.9 percent. And then you have the likes of Michael Reed of RBC saying fade the quote weakness because guess where the rise in unemployment came from? 16 and 19 year olds who are no longer getting jobs. So at a certain point, who are we talking about here? and starting to look beneath the hood. North of 200,000 jobs being created, really weak. The uh, debate will continue. Uh, speaking of fate of the weakness, wasn't it Barclays this morning who was saying maybe fade some of the move in the bond market as well? We've had a 20 to 30 basis point move lower in yields across the curve. I saw that, and I think about how many people are probably going to join that, given the fact that there still is this risk with CPI, and frankly, there still is quite a bit of strength. You're not seeing some sort of r huge wave of layoffs or any kind of real sign of weakness. It just isn't as hot as it could have been, and that was enough for the market last week. Let's turn to foreign exchange. I want to look at dollar yen at 146.65, negative on this currency pair for a fifth straight session. So that's yen strength. I said before the commercial break, biggest data point of the week, maybe not stateside, perhaps not CPI. Maybe you'll find it in Japan. On Friday, the largest union announcing wage negotiation results as a data point, Lisa, informing central bank decisions. That might be it for the week, the number one. A hundred percent, especially because a lot of other unions have already negotiated wage increases that are the most going back to 2011 or even more. This is the question. How much does it push them to raise rates? And not only that, but do they push it more uh, positive, right? So it's not just to zero, but also straight to 0.25%. The start of a cycle, the first hike since 07. Unbelievable stuff. Another morning of yen strength. Under surveillance this morning, our top stories. Investors keeping a close eye on data this week, looking for clues about when the Fed might start cutting interest rates. Following Friday's mixed payrolls report, February CPI due out tomorrow and PPI and retail sales on Thursday. The Fed meeting next week and is widely expected to hold interest rates steady for its fifth consecutive meeting. Next week is all about the outlook, the summary of economic projections. And most of the reading I've done over the weekend, Lisa, is suggesting they're going to be basically unchanged relative to what we saw in December. The round trip has happened in the market. It Big hasn't time. happened with respect to the Fed's uh, expectations. And frankly, the market has come to what the, uh, the Fed has said. Stuart Kaiser put it really well of Citigroup. He came out and said CPI is now priced as the largest risk event in March, that this is entirely going to be a Fed Reserve dependent on the March 12 CPI. And if it comes in hotter than expected, expect some more doubt raised about how quickly they can cut rates. Bloomberg Intelligence look at the gasoline prices for a reason why we could see a slight uptick to the prior month. I have to say that would be incredibly interesting because gasoline prices have been on the side of this administration this year going into an election and it's been the jewel really of lower inflation prints. The fact that gasoline prices have been so low. I mentioned some of the estimates a little bit earlier this morning just to share them with you again if you are just tuning in. CPI tomorrow, strip out food and energy. Month over month we're looking for zero point three percent the previous month zero point four let's turn to our next story president biden taking on tiktok biden saying he'll support a quickly moving bipartisan bill that could ban the social media app if congress passes it the bill would require tiktok parent bike dance to divest it or face a ban on u.s app stores the bill cites national security concerns tiktok has pushed back on those allegations everywhere you look in washington you will always find contradictions which is why i think we all get driven nuts by politicians week after week week after week and this one is just a massive contradiction. To hear the president say, if you pass it, I'll sign it. And at the same time, you've got a campaign as you run to be the president of the United States campaigning on TikTok simultaneously. Well, Senator Warren, Warner was on Face the Nation this weekend. He said he's uncomfortable with that mixed message. He said it is a mixed message. But the president also need, knows that this needs to get to the House, needs to get to the Senate. Of course, the government is not using it. The White House is not using it. But they feel that they need to go out and get that youth vote that helped him in 2020. And to reach the youth, they have to go to TikTok. What happened with Oracle? 
I mean, seriously, like, I, I want to understand the anatomy of this concern, which has been prevalent for a long time. Why does it die and get regurgitated yeah. every couple of months? Everyone should go back to the stories of summer 2020. I think the deadline was the middle of September, something like September 15th. And this all started in August of that year. And I remember it wasn't just that the deal went to, say, Oracle and Walmart. It was also that there was this specified amount of money that you had to give to Treasury to get the deal. It was almost like a commission fee for President Donald Trump at the White House. It was truly bizarre. I think the number was about $5 billion. And it was going to the Treasury, wasn't it, AMH, to help yeah. education or something like that. It was such a bizarre period. What was weird about it is we just kind of moved on from it really quickly and stopped talking about it. Well, in the end, Trump just said he's going to ban it. And then it was held up in court. Biden administration came in. They said, OK, this is being held up in courts. We're going to do our own review of it. And now it has been sitting in a CFIUS review while hardliners in Congress said they want to take up a bill that would give the president the authority without having to deal with potentially some of this legal pushback to actually ban it. And that's where we are today. I'm not sure what I think about the former president's business model that he was setting up for the White House, that the White House could just break up companies and then charge a commission to American companies that could buy them. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre, wasn't it? It was weird then. It's weird to think about yeah, now. Yeah, well, we get to talk about it again. Yeah, we do. And maybe sometime soon. A slew of data out of China. CPI rising for the first time since August, increasing 0.7% from a year ago. PPI falling 2.7%, continuing the longest string of declines since 2016. This is the annual National People's Congress comes to a close in Beijing. And the current joins us now from DC. One of my favourite quotes coming off the back of this get-together, the annual get-together, and the came from the Texas. They said it was a target without a plan, a growth target without a plan. Do they have a plan? I mean, obviously they have a plan, but there's scepticism about whether or not they will meet what they want this year, John, which is uh, the growth target of about 5%. And in fact, even inflation is meant to come in at 3% according to the objective targets. But as you mentioned, those numbers over the weekend did show a pickup in inflation last month. But that's actually being put down to the Lunar New Year holiday period. That was because people travelled more, spent more on food. Uh, tourism prices actually rose by 23%. There was a bad weather effect and there was a, a base effect there as well. So, you know, inflation is expected to be, is, is expected to pull out of deflation this year but as you mentioned it's going to be a lot of work to hit these key targets the growth target the inflation target to keep within their boring strategy that they've laid out without without the need to support the rest of the economy there's still i think a lot of pressure and a lot of question marks around whether or not Beijing can turn the economy around this year. And that remains very much, I think, an open book for foreign investors. There also are questions around what exactly is the state of the Chinese economy right now, because we do see consumer spending picking up when it comes to certain things like restaurants or even travel. And yet iron ore is falling the most since 2022 today. It's the lowest since August. And we've seen the stockpiles really increase dramatically in China. There's no doubt iron ore is a fascinating one to watch. It's always been the 101 proxy for where China's economy is headed. I think it surprised most people last year that it held up as high as it did, despite the mood music on China's economy. We also had language over the weekend repeating the point that uh, houses are for living in, not for speculating. That doesn't lend itself towards the idea of, of a ra of rapid surgery to turn the housing market around. I think, as we were saying, these cities, there are still significant question marks around where China's economy is going to go this year. They have set a, a growth target of 5%. That's very aggressive because they don't have a favourable base effect and the boring targets they've set out do suggest an increase in stimulus, but it's still got a long way to go. Consumer sentiment is somewhat mixed, but I think most people would agree it's certainly not where it could be, not what it was back in the, in the roaring decade that we just left. I think we'll have to keep an eye on above all else the housing market, see what kind of intervention the authorities do there, when and if they can turn that around. And when, that, when and if that turns around, that will drive the rest of the China economy story, including iron ore prices. You know, I'm still struck by what Leland Miller of the China Beige Book said, where maybe Xi Jinping doesn't care if he doesn't hit his 5% target, that maybe he doesn't care if there isn't more strength because their goals right now are elsewhere other than just supporting the economy. Do you agree with that, that essentially it's no longer a priority to keep the economy really roaring and that now it's about making more products in China and instating some other of Xi Jinping's goals? I mean, some of that's, some, you can look at it both ways. Uh, there's no doubt that they want more sustainable growth. They are not advocating the go-go years that we all became used to of rapid growth in China at any, at any cost. That's gone. They want sustainable growth. And within that, Lisa, you're absolutely right. They, they're talking a lot now about innovation, technology, high quality growth, I think was one of the phrases that came out of the NPC or is being used a lot more recently. 
But at the same time, though, if they set a growth target of 5%, you know, the authorities in Beijing will want to hit that, or they'll want to come pretty close. It's not like they totally will walk away from it, barring some kind of emergency, which we saw during the pandemic, for example. So I think both can be correct. They do have top priorities there. You'd have to say security, technological development, of course, and innovation uh, is probably number one on the list. But at the same time, Growing the economy and ensuring that uh, consumption and wealth is increasing is also very important. And that's why I think there's still an expectation that the government will come pretty close to hitting the 5% target when it's all added up in the, at the end of the year. The Chinese legislator today voted to change a four-decade-old law, really tightens the grip uh, in China for things like she thought. Does that have any impact, Enda, on the economy? Well, so again, this is an outside looking in view. A lot of people say, Anne-Marie, that how really can you have an economy prosper and thrive when you have this level of party control, this level of, of doctrinaire control on, on all aspects of how uh, decisions are made, how companies operate, how people invest. So this is a source of criticism. Uh, you've heard business people make the point that China flourished when the party kind of stepped back, so to speak, in, in those years and allowed innovation and technology and homegrown uh, technology uh, to get off the ground. And now, of course, the party's intervening in, in everything. The party at the centre of everything, I think, is one of the lines. But this goes to the idea that China's economy is now putting national security front and centre. They want to spur innovation, technology. They want to do get uh, get the key parts of the economy that's in national interest in place uh, because they're in a strategic race now with the US. So, there, of course, there's criticism of the role the party is playing. Uh, China pushes back to say they've got their own strategic and national interests to pursue, and that's what they're doing now. What we've seen over this meeting is there's been no press conference, and we've seen China and Xi Jinping take a tighter grip on the government. What kind of message is this going to send, Enda, to foreign investors? I think the press conference definitely is was a negative look for foreign investors. Uh, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, did give his press conference, of course, but there's no doubt that the highlight of the embassy every year was when the premier came out to speak to reporters, but not only that, to speak to the world and add some colour onto what the economic policy was for the year ahead. Of course, it was somewhat of a controlled press conference, but nonetheless, it was one of the few opportunities to question one of the top leaders of China. And when they pulled back from doing that, in the context of everything else that we've seen over the past few years, not least those raids on foreign business, and as you mentioned, the, the ongoing control of the party in business and in the economy. Uh, given the context that foreign investor sentiment in China is already so low, it certainly doesn't help that. I think it adds to the scepticism. And as we see with portfolio flows and as we see with declining FDI, I think the foreign world remains to be convinced as to the tra trajectory True. of China's economy at the moment. And a thank you, sir. And a current down in Washington, D.C. Started this out by talking about no news being good news stateside. I think no news in China, at least the bad news. Looking at the headlines we saw again this morning in the commodity market. Everyone was looking for stimulus. They've been waiting for the bazooka to come in. It hasn't happened. They've talked about maybe doing some additional stimulus around the margins, and now people say basically are saying, show us the money. Otherwise, forget it. Big time. That big red headline across the Bloomberg, iron ore getting hit and getting hit hard. That's the story in China. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Let's get to your Bloomberg brief. Our first story, Reddit and its investors are seeking to raise as much as a quarter of a billion dollars in what would be one of the biggest IPOs so far this year. The company plans to offer 22 million shares in the IPO, priced between 31 and $34 each, according to a filing with the SEC. Reddit is seeking a listing on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker RDDT. Elsewhere, more trouble for Boeing. Delta says it expects deliveries of its Boeing 737 MAX 10 aircraft could be pushed out to its latest 2027 as the plane maker undergoes more federal safety and criminal reviews. Delta CEO said yesterday it had expected to begin receiving the aircraft as soon as next year, but is now anticipating the delays. The airline has orders for 100 MAX 10 planes and options to purchase 30 more. And finally, Oppenheimer has picked up a total of seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director for Christopher Nolan. Barbie's eight nominations amounted to just one trophy for the best song in a night that saw Hollywood's old guard return to glory amid disappointment for streaming companies. Disney's Poor Things won four awards, including Best Actress for Emma Stone, beating Lily Gladstone, who was in line to become the first Native American to win an Oscar for her role in Apple's Killers of the Flower Moon. Oppenheimer just absolutely crushing it. Ramo, and deservedly so, just a fantastic movie. That's what I was going to say. It's a great movie and frankly one that could be watched again and again to really pair this question of if you can build it, should you? 
at a moment where the world potentially is going to deal with the consequences for a long time. Do you want the Faro movie review of the weekend? Dune 2 was actually pretty Tunnels. decent. What was it? It, it, it was, the, it was <laughs> better than Dune 1. I can tell you more Did you a little bit later. Did you finish Dune 1? Converted. Really? I got through most of Dune 1 before walking most. out of the cinema, before it finished. Dune 2 was worth a watch. Worm tunnels, you, you enjoy them now? They can ride worms now, apparently. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> Up next on the program, the case against data dependency. Do we want to really drive a car, look at the rearview mirror with a map that may be completely revised? Of course not, right? But that's the problem with being overly data dependent. That conversation coming up next. from New York City. Stock's a little softer. We're down by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Quick snapshot of the bond market for you. Unchanged on a 10-year yield, 4.07, 88%. Under surveillance this morning, the case against data dependency. You have two issues with excessive data dependency. One is that data gets revised. And two, for the Fed, it has tools that operate with a lag. So do we want to really drive a car, look at the rearview mirror with a map that may be completely revised? Of course not, right? But that's the problem with being overly data dependent. Without that strategic view, that data will take you on a roller coaster and you'll get sick on it. Fantastic line from Mohammed Al Arian. Here's the latest this morning. Traders boosting bets on a June rate cut after the February payrolls report with more data on deck. CPI due tomorrow, followed by retail sales and PPI on Thursday. Andrew Hottenhorst of City writing this. The lower year-on-year -year inflation readings should keep Fed officials on track to begin cutting rates in June. A cut in May is possible, but probably only if core CPI comes in weaker than expected or activity data weakens more than we expect. Andrew Hottenhorst joins us now for more. Andrew, good morning to you. Good morning. What to pick up on Mohammed's line because I think this is really important. How dependable is the economic data when they say they are dependent on all of it? Yeah, I think we're on that roller coaster that he was talking about. We had 275,000 new jobs. It's a strong jobs number for the month of February. But then you look back and you had 167,000 jobs that we thought were there that are no longer there. So I think that is exactly an example of the problem of tying yourself too closely to the data. I'm going to paraphrase your work over the weekend, solid today, recession tomorrow. What is it about now that inspires a little bit of confidence, but ultimately also informs this idea that we're going to roll over pretty soon? It, so if you go back to that jobs report, I think that's a good example. 275,000 jobs, 3.9 percent unemployment rate. There's no way you can look at that and not say that's a, not a strong jobs market. It is. The issue is the trends that you're seeing, and that's what we really do as economists, is try to look at the trend and figure out where that trend is going. Data have been mixed, which I think shows that we're going into this kind of a transition period. That 3.9% unemployment rate is low, but it's up 0.4 percentage points off the low. And when you start to have this slowing in the job market, what we've seen historically is it's very hard for that not to develop into a more significant slowdown. So that's what keeps us thinking that this will weaken further later this year. What's the Fed's role in this, especially because you've been out front saying that there's actually more strength in the data in the first half of the year than people are expecting. And then that's going to force the Fed to cut more aggressively later in the year. Do you think that by not cutting rates this month, the Fed is going to essentially front uh, carry forward some of the weaker growth that you expect later in the year? Well, I think we're in a scenario that we haven't really experienced in, in decades, in a sense, in that we have inflation that's running above target, and we will have this emerging weakness in the activity data. So then you really have to ask the difficult question of, are you responding to the inflation mandate? Are you explain, uh, responding to the employment mandate? Um, so I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer for the Fed here. Um, I do think that they're seeing enough in those inflation readings that will get them to a cut in June. Your, uh, your compatriot, Stuart Kaiser, talking about CPI is going to be an incredibly important figure for them to look at. Some people expecting it to be uh, hotter than expected to what Anne-Marie was talking about, the fact that you have seen gasoline prices increasing pretty significantly. How much do you think that would really color their view? Yeah, I think what's really going to matter for the Fed here is the core. I'm interested in those gasoline prices also. I think it's interesting, as we've seen, 
consumers that are more positive on the economy. Part of that probably is gasoline prices that have come down. So let's watch that on the gasoline side. On the inflation report itself and what it means for the Fed, we're projecting 0.33% month-on-month core CPI inflation, and that's following 0.39% month-on-month core CPI inflation. And those are somewhat uncomfortable readings if what you're telling the American public is that we're coming back to 2% inflation, because it's just not 2% inflation. Now, if you look at year-on-year core PCE inflation, um, that was running up above 3%. It's going to keep coming down just the way the base effects work. That should be running more like 2.5% around the summer. So I think that does keep them on track to cut rates. Um, But have we really defeated inflation? That's not clear. You say a cut in May is possible. What would you need to see? I think there are a couple ways you could get there. One would be just that this core inflation report, instead of coming in at a 0.33, let's see it come, say it comes in at 0.20. Maybe some of the strength that we saw in shelter prices, that turns out to be a one-off, and we really slow down um, in this month's print. That would at least put May more solidly on the table. And then you probably also need some kind of wobble in the activity data. With 275,000 payrolls, you know, we think retail sales is going to be strong this week. Let's say retail sales is weaker, we have a softer inflation report, then I think we'll start pricing that May cut again, and that that could become a reality. If rate hikes didn't slow things down, why will rate cuts help things pick up in the face of adverse data? I ask that because Governor Waller basically said, what's the rush? And President Kaskari said, why do anything? Does any of that resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's kind of getting at this notion of where is the neutral rate of interest? Where do we have policy rates relative to what would be a neutral rate of interest. And I think it's just really hard to assess in this environment because we had incredible fiscal stimulus that came into the economy. So it could be that interest rates had the slowing effect on the economy, if you will, but it was offset by the fiscal effect of stimulus. So how do you disentangle those two? What we do know it very clearly is in the housing market. If you raise interest rates, you slow down the housing market. If you lower interest rates, you speed up the housing market. So that's what I would be really looking for in terms of a a beta or a sensitivity to interest rates. But to John's point, there's a question about urgency, right? I mean, if we haven't seen the kind of immediate effects, what would it matter if they cut 25 basis points now or in June or even in October? Yeah, it goes back to Mohamed El Arian's point, which is that you want to have a strategy and a framework for how you're pursuing these rate cuts or interest rate policy in general. What the economy will respond to is not the overnight policy rate. There's very little economic activity that's tied to that. What the economy is tied to is where is the 10-year Treasury rate? Where do individuals borrow for a 30-year mortgage? Where do corporates borrow for a five-year corporate bond? Um, That's what you're really controlling, and that's going to be dependent on where do markets think you're going over time. And that is what is spelled out by your reaction function, by your strategy. And so this whole discussion of, do you cut in May? Do you cut in June? Do you cut in July? The the timing of that rate cut, I think Fed officials are right. It doesn't doesn't really matter what specific meeting you cut. Just got a great question from a Bloomberg subscriber on the terminal, just pop up on the screen. It's related to markets, but equity markets. Maybe some more speculative like assets elsewhere in financial markets. Is the Fed going to be concerned about that? They start to cut interest rates and they carry on ripping. Are we at the point where this becomes a financial stability concern? Are we anywhere near those kind of concerns? I think it's something that they should be thinking about. Ultimately, it's overall financial conditions that are going to feed into the economy. And when you see various assets, especially some of the riskier assets that are at all time highs, I think that should be an indication that there is a loosening of financial conditions, a very significant loosening of financial conditions that's happened since that October, November period. Remember, we were talking about lower equity prices, higher treasury yields. Um, This is something that the Fed partially has engineered through their policy. Um, So absolutely, it should be an input into policy. Lisa, stocks have absolutely ripped since the end of October and haven't stopped ripping. And you talk about the IPOs, Reddit coming to market. I mean, it's yeah. sort of like sort of the key poster child for a period of where Bitcoin is surging to record highs. At what point does this matter? At a time when some people are saying this is actually easing financial conditions and pushing the Fed further away from their target, they don't seem to care. Torsten Slock of Apollo said it last week on this program. In fact, he asked the question, are they really going to reduce interest rates with equities at all-time highs and credit spreads incredibly tight? 
We'll see. Andrew, thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Andrew Honhorst of City going into that data later this week. CPI tomorrow. After that, a couple of days later, we'll get retail sales, PPI and jobless claims. Coming up in the next hour on this programme, Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management, Henrietta Trays of Vader Partners, Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College joining us as well on a Monday morning with equity futures negative by, let's call it 0.1% on the S&P 500, following last week's very mild marginal pullback on a weekly basis on the S&P. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. The economy is humming along. There's not a lot of reason with growth to cut rates. You'll have more of the same, stronger growth, slower inflation. Where good news is good news, bad news is probably still good news because it probably accelerates the number of rate cuts that we're going to get. Right now, we're, we're very much in a soft landing. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, your equity market basically unchanged on the S&P 500 like it was last week. Last week down about a quarter of 1% this morning, negative by 0.1. A massive week for data this week informing Federal Reserve decisions of next week and maybe even beyond. CPI, Bramo, just around the corner. Then look to retail sales and jobless claims. Given the fact that we already got a jobless a job number that really was hotter than expected, at least in the headline level, but revised lower, the question now is, does this come with inflation or not? Ultimately, Stuart Kaiser saying this is going to be the key point for the Federal Reserve that comes out next week and has to decide what they guide the market to after the market's really repriced dramatically so far this year. And who needs Fed speakers and economists on Wall Street when the president himself will tell you <laughs> When the central bank's going to act, Bramo, AMH apparently is going to happen sometime soon. Sometime soon. That, quote, little outfit is what the president of the United States was calling the Federal Reserve when he said on Friday night he betcha those rates are going to be coming down. Uh, Jonathan, the timeline may be on the president's side. Interesting in the CPI report, I'm going to be looking at gasoline, which Bloomberg Intelligence says is creeping up. This could be something that could hurt this administration going to election, though, if we see gasoline come in higher than expected, even going into the summer peak driving season. Um, but, you know, look at the FT poll over the weekend. People are feeling better about the economy. The issue politically is they're not giving Biden credit. Well, what's Biden doing talking about the Fed? The Fed's going to cut rates anyway. This doesn't help them. This just makes it seem like it's political, even if it's not. He wants to take credit for it? I don't know. I thought it was bizarre. Some people thought it was controversial. I didn't. I thought it was just a bit silly. Well, I just don't understand what he's driving at. How does he get points and kudos for calling it a little outfit and saying you should do it when they're going to do it anyway, and they don't want to seem political? Well, we have seen Biden really lean into the issues with the housing market and how people cannot get on the housing scale. What, they're, what he's going to be talking about today when his budget comes out is something he talked about in, this, in the State of the Union, which is trying to give rebates for individuals to try to get on the property ladder. And cutting those interest rates feeds into that theme. This is very much to the Senator Elizabeth Warren camp of the Democratic Party. The cutting rates, though, not a demand side story for me, supply side. It's unlocking the sellers. Bramo, that's what it's all about, because they've been locked up, those people like you, with 2 3% mortgage rates that won't sell their homes. You're just like, you know, looking over at me, trying to wind me up. You're the problem. Don't you agree, you're though? The it's I a supply-side story. Yeah, it, okay, you need to have a market before you can understand what the pricing is. And I understand yep. that people like myself are not going to sell until they can buy something else with a mortgage rate that makes sense. Well, President Biden wants to give people like you $10,000 tax credit just for selling their homes. Sell your house, Bramo. It'll give you 10K. <laughs> Do you want to sell your house? And then John can buy it. <laughs> no. Let's move on. Didn't think so. Happy to move on. <laughs> Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative 0.1% on the S&P. It's a small pullback. It's not a big deal. If you want some price action, can we throw up NVIDIA in the pre-market and just check it out briefly? Up by about 1.2% this morning. At least a Friday session was just odd. Positive 5%. And then down at the close by negative 5.55% at the close on Friday. It was $250 billion of market cap wiped out in three hours. What I find interesting is overnight, a Sunday night, you look at the gyrations in NVIDIA's stock. It's been something like $300 billion of market cap that you've seen just wiped out, brought back, wiped out, brought back. And yep. it just sort of raises this question, OK, well, what's going on here? Does this indicate maybe some kind of topping out? That has got to be the biggest one day destruction of market cap on a single name with no catalyst almost for no reason. 
and that no one seems to care about at all because ultimately they've gained so much. But you're right. We're talking big numbers. We're talking about a third of the S&P's performance so far this year tied up with NVIDIA's performance. So this really raises this question. It's the reason why I want to see Oracle earnings after the bell today. How much money are companies actually putting into investing in tech uh, advancements at a time where this is supposed to be the future, but a lot of companies are talking for cost efficiency? Good point. NVIDIA in the pre-market positive by 1.2%. Coming up this hour, Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management <laughs> Expecting volatility in equity markets. Henrietta Trey's of Vader Partners as the president weighs in on a TikTok ban. And Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College on why the time to buy T-bills is now. We begin with our top story. Stocks edging lower to kick off a data-packed week. CPI, PPI and retail sales all coming ahead of next week's Fed decision. Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management expecting rate cuts to start mid-year and writing this. Equities will likely see volatility ahead in the first half, followed by a renewed rally in the second. Once cyclical indicators bottom out and rate cuts finally begin, U.S. small cap stocks should begin to narrow the valuation gap with large caps. Seema, I'm pleased to say Joins us now for more. Seema, good to see you. Welcome stateside. Great to be here. Let's get into that call. Too early to buy small caps still? I think that we should be edging into it, right? I don't expect that you're going to see a straight line up by any means in the near future. As long as you've got the debate going on about rate cuts and the timing, growth, etc., then things will be difficult. But once you get closer and you can really see rate cuts in line of sight and it's backed up by a still solid economy, slowing but solid, then that should really be the green light for small caps. When you say edging, edging, edging from what? What are you leaving behind at the expense of large cap tech? At no. the expense of what? So we're not trying to take away from large cap. Actually, we're just adding to the US at the moment. So taking away from a couple of other regions and adding it to the US. Because I think it's a really brave person to say that at this point, yes, valuations are very, very expensive for large tech. But we're looking at tech over a long time horizon. And if there's going to be any pullbacks, any meaningful pullback, we're probably looking to add at some stage. We're definitely not going to be taking away. So this is trying to create a little bit more movement for the small cap space. Taking away from a couple of regions. Are you talking about Europe? Yes. OK, why? <laughs> Look, for Europe, the fundamentals are just very, very unattractive. Look, valuations continue to look attractive, but they always have. That's not a new story. It's, it's to say, you know, we write that in our report every year. Valuations are very attractive, but it's a value trap at this stage. So for fundamentals have to be in line with your valuations, and they don't look like they're very promising for this year. This is still a year for us in terms of US exceptionalism. There are other parts of the world which are attractive, Latin America, India, Japan to some extent, although maybe with some ambiguity being added to that. But Europe particularly is, is not the area that we want to be focused on. I did want to ask you about some of the splintering that we see in the MAG7 and what, what you take of that. But I have to ask about Jeff Yu's call over at BNY Mellon. Do you agree then that we could see parity on the euro and not the dollar, given the fact that there does seem to be this dissonance that hasn't been recognized by currency markets yet? It's an interesting idea. And if I go all the way to parity, but I certainly do expect, I mean, look, I think that the ECB has to move either way, right? Um, I think they're going to cut rates ideally sometime in line with the Fed. But if the Fed isn't moving, the ECB still has to go because they have a difficult economic story ahead of them. Um, so then that does pull apart the euro and the dollar, pushing the euro down a bit further. But I wonder how aggressive the ECB can be. I mean, they get going, but they would like to be more aggressive and they can only be more aggressive if the Fed is also cutting. You think the Fed decision informs the scale of ECB cuts this year? Well, I think the currency is what's going to be informing because we know that the ECB is, is typically very, very hawkish. I don't think it drives their decision making, but I think it's something which does come into their consideration. They will never say that, of course, as we heard from Lagarde. Uh, but I do think that at the back of the mind, it is certainly playing. It raises the question, how much influence does the FX channel actually have on inflation in the eurozone? If we get the Jeff Yu of BNY, BNY Mellon call who joined us about an hour ago, who was talking about parity, Lisa mentioned that. If we get the parity move, how does that influence the inflation story in the eurozone? It will affect the inflation story, but it's also really going to help the export side of the economy. It's going to help the manufacturing side of the economy, which is really struggling. For a country like Germany, uh, which has, I think, stagnation written all over it at this stage, I think it could do with any help it can get. So the currency, it's, of course, it's concerning slightly on the inflation side a bit. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the ECB will probably go a little bit slower than they would like to. But I don't think that it's uh, enough to scare them off from, from cutting rates. You talk about American exceptionalism, and we've been trying to digest some of the moves in NVIDIA. We've been trying to digest some of the moves in Apple and Tesla and this question around whether that's going to start to infect the rest of the complex. How do you stay confident 
in names that have rallied so dramatically and are now showing signs of exhaustion? It is difficult, but look, we, we have to look at the earnings story. Um, and again, we look at it over the longer term, what are the potential? We know that in the next couple of months, there is certainly there is risk in those names. Uh, and you can see that bifurcation coming through in that MAG7 anyway as well. But I think that when it comes to technology, we do look at that productivity story. We're looking at over a longer term horizon of what AI can do. And that's the position that we're taking. It is uncomfortable. It certainly will be uncomfortable over the couple of months. Uh, but again, you're taking the long game on this one. How do you price in the China risk at a time where you have Gina Raimondo talking this morning about the U.S. doing whatever it takes to curb Chinese tech? We have a potential TikTok ban. You have a potential tit for tat escalating more dramatically. Has it been fully priced in, not just to tech, but also just to the multinationals? I 100% agree. I, think, I don't think that is sufficiently priced. And actually, you know, over the last couple of years, every time we talk about large cap, the two things that are always a little bit concerning, or at least has, add hesitation, is regulation and China. And at the moment, those two are coinciding. So we don't think that's been fully priced in. Uh, it's something that we are watching very carefully. If we were to see some significant movement on that, which is really changing investor perspectives, then that's a case for maybe some reevaluation, but I don't think we're there yet. I think it, it impacts the earnings story, but not sufficiently that over the next three or four year horizon, um, it's going to take away as much as, um, as maybe it would convince us to, to reduce our exposure. It begs the question, Tesla last week down by about 13%. China was part of this story. I know you can't do single names, but I just wanted the signal you take from some of these big cap tech stocks that have been hit by China concerns. What is the signal you take? Well, OK, so there's, there's specific names in there as well, which sure. I think we do have concerns about, especially on the EV side. Uh, so we are trying to take a lot of that into consideration. I think on the EV side, we do have maybe more sustained concerns um, where in the Europe China too. angle comes in. Can I ask you that? No, in actually, Europe no. as well? Is it, how so different is Europe. it in the continent? You're in London every day. How different is it over in Europe compared to, say, the US and China? I, I actually think that the EV market in Europe, particularly in London, is extraordinarily strong. That, that drive that is, well, the drive, the, the demand for EV, just because well, of the way that the London congestion zone, et cetera, works, it's, it's a very different story. I won't ask you to explain the London congestion system, but certainly regionally it feels very, very different. The experience stateside is not what you see playing out in Europe or China. You have better adoption in terms of just the consistency of some of the charging stations and the willingness of people to use cars. And we saw this with the rental car uh, experiment, which to me showed everything. The fact that people shied away from electric vehicles because they just weren't used to using them. And that was the start of it this year. Hertz dumping like 20,000 EVs. Seema, good to see you to break down some of these issues. Thank you. Seema Shah is going to be sticking with us. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. President Biden is warning Israel that any invasion of the southern Gaza city of Rafah would cross a red line. In an interview with MSNBC, the president criticized the high death toll in Gaza. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons, but there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. President Biden had hoped for a breakthrough in talks before Ramadan, which began last night. But negotiations have stalled. Apple is preparing to open its eighth store in Shanghai this month. The move adds to its largest retail network outside the U.S. This despite slowing iPhone sales in China. It will be Apple's 47th location in the country. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says the U.S. could further tighten controls on China's access to chip technology. Raimondo telling reporters, quote, we cannot allow China to have access for their military advancement to our most sophisticated technology. Raimondo adding the U.S. will do whatever it takes to keep Chinese firms from accessing U.S. chip information. Her comments come as the Biden administration also weighs sanctions on several Chinese companies to curb the nation's development of semiconductors. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Looking forward to catching up later this hour. Up next on the program, Washington, D.C., taking on TikTok. We would lead to a path of potentially banning TikTok. Half of young people in America get a lot of their news all from TikTok. Uh -huh. If you don't think the Chinese Communist Party can twist that algorithm, then I don't think you appreciate the nature of the threat. That conversation coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning.
Live from New York City, stocks lower by 0.1% on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields basically unchanged. Where they were Friday at the close, 4.08%. Let's call it in foreign exchange, the euro doing absolutely nothing. 109.40 on euro dollar. Under surveillance this morning, Washington DC taking on TikTok. We would lead to a path of potentially banning TikTok. Half of young people in America get a lot of their news all from TikTok. Uh -huh. If you don't think the Chinese Communist Party can twist that algorithm to make it the news that they see reflective of their views, then I don't think you appreciate the nature of the threat. The reason why TikTok is so attractive, its value is it has an algorithm, a recommender engine, which is one of the best in the world. That is owned by ByteDance. As long as ByteDance engineers in China control the algorithm, they have to have access to American data. It's the latest this morning. The House set to vote this week on a bipartisan bill that could force TikTok's parent company ByteDance to divest from the app or face a ban in the U.S. President Biden throwing his support behind the bill, saying, quote, if they pass it, I'll sign it. Henry Trace of Vader Partners joins us now for more. We won't get into whether the kids are communists already because some might suggest they already are. I'm trying to work out if they pass it or not. They're going to pass it? Uh, if they put this on the floor, it will pass. I mean, think of the optics of not voting in favor of this bill. This committee, where it's coming from, is extraordinarily bipartisan. It's gotten, you know, glowing, remark, glowing marks across the board since it launched. If it comes to the floor of the House, it will pass. And then once it gets to the Senate, those two guys that you just had on, Mark Warner and Rubio, uh, are the ones who are going to decide whether they want to tweak it or not. Now, they've gone through myriad iterations of this kind of a bill. So we've been working on this for years. ByteDance has known that this is coming. They have had public hearings. This is the kind of thing where they have given you fair warning. You should have been acting. Um, so now we're in the realm of the purely political. Um, my expectation is if it goes to the floor, it will pass. So the, it, the decision is leadership. And obviously, pres former President Trump has weighted in exhaustively. Um, and I think that the lobbying associated with that and Club for Growth is where the whole story is at this point. And Kellyanne Conway as well is said to be working on behalf of uh, TikTok in the sense calling lawmakers, telling them why they should not vote for this. With Trump weighing in, we've seen him weigh in on the border agreement and that got pushed to the side. Does that happen with Speaker Johnson and TikTok? It absolutely could. I mean, you've seen it with Ukraine aid, Israel aid and the border bill. If Trump wants to derail this package in the House, he just needs to call Speaker Johnson, let him know that this bill should not come for a vote. And uh, like I said, if it comes to the floor, it means that Trump's lobbying has not worked. Kellyanne Conway's lobbying has not worked. The Club for Growth and their $10 million um, allocation to the super PAC has not been sufficient and they will bring it to the floor and it will pass. But political meddling at this point is what would keep Keep it from passing. The bill is sound. The bill, as it stands, can pass the Constitution test. It does not explicitly ban TikTok. It goes after the nations of, of issue, China, Russia, etc. When can we actually see a ban, though? Because to John's point earlier on the hypocrisy we're seeing in Washington, Biden's campaign is using this for outreach for 2024. It, at a minimum, it wouldn't go into effect for six months. There are so many ways to delay this from actually being effective. So they have, you know, studies that they can conduct. And then it's up to the president for his uh, ultimate decision. I mean, this is the kind of thing that can take months to years before it has any ramifications. And just because it passes doesn't mean it's going to actually require ByteDance to divest. It's uh, the beginning of the process. Just to underscore this, what proportion of Congress members, not to mention the POTUS himself, currently use TikTok? I mean, most of them. It's a huge campaign tool. Uh, you see them across the board. And of course, the president just waded in with his own TikTok campaign. And if you look at the letter that all those Republicans who are adamantly anti-President uh, Biden and are working on behalf of President Trump or former President Trump are have just written him a letter. I think it was, what, two weeks ago, a week ago, saying, how dare you? You know, this is ridiculous that you would get on TikTok to try to uh, boost your campaign when you're supposedly anti-TikTok. And now you're going to come out and say you support this bill. So the hypocrisy is all the way around, which is why you know, you're basically in a political universe. So they're all trying to score points uh, back and forth right now. Politicians, hypocrites, shocking. Absolutely okay, shocking. but the level here is pretty unbelievable. I agree. I mean, they're like saying, well, at least it won't go into effect for six months. So we could still <laughs> advertise Look on TikTok. Look at how it's lining up, though. We've got the national security risks of EVs. One, going to do something about that potentially. National security risk around bike dance and TikTok. Two, potentially going to do something about that. Henry, for a long time, it was difficult for certain U.S. companies to operate in China. There are certain tech companies that aren't there because they weren't allowed to be. So they're not too vulnerable. I'm thinking about everyone else. What is the tit for tat going to look like from China if we go in this direction? 
That's the question. And it's not going to be just limited to this, as you pointed out. And we're expecting USTR to announce a rotation of tariffs, potentially taking off some of the list 4A tariffs to put on the, sec the um, electric vehicles tariffs. It fits very neatly with their uh, data privacy talking points around health care products, around um, monitoring where Americans are going, LIDAR, what our roads look like. It's across the board. So a Chinese retaliation is not just limited to, hey, we're not buying soybeans anymore. It's applicable to, um, you know, different sanctions regimes, kicking out companies that are in the United States, uh, excuse me, that are in China, that are U.S. companies, um, exhaustive red tape. We saw this all during the 2017 and 18 escalation of the 301 tariffs. They um, tend to take it out on the U.S. corporations that are operating inside of China. What's the daylight between Biden and Trump on China? Do you see any? There's really not. I mean, if you meet with Ambassador Tai, she will happily tell you that the tariffs are higher under Biden than they were under Trump. There are no exclusions. Um, you see China and the EU even negoti not negotiating with the U.S. right now. And in part, you have to think, is it because President, uh, a hypothetical President Trump would create um, loopholes or exclusions or licenses or one-on-one um, -on -one trade deals like we saw with Huawei or ZTE, wherein specific companies can get a carve-out when you have even these efforts that are seemingly broad in scope and then you get all these licenses. I mean, go look at the USTR exclusions process. It was exhaustive during the Trump term, and it, those are limited now. Let's bring in Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management to weigh in on the conversation. Seema, how difficult is life going to be for a multinational operating in both the United States and China over the next few years? Look, it's clearly going to be difficult, but we still think that for a government to try and hit its own major industry, which is driving a lot of wealth, that there's some hesitation that, you know, there will be some kind of loopholes. I think that when we think about the US election, for example, and what's going to happen and how investors should think about it, it's the rest of the world that will suffer. So I think this still points back to US exceptionalism, that there will be some kind of precedence for US markets, US industries at the end of it, whereas Europe, China are probably going to be the biggest losers. So are you saying that basically, regardless of some of the heated rhetoric around the US and potential bans to China, nothing will actually get implemented that could actually start this tit-for-tat war that could cause major uh, hurdles for certain multinational companies? So I think there could be something, but in terms of the, the, the hit, who's the hit going to be greatest to? I don't think it's going to be to the US. I think it will only work particularly negatively for Europe and China. So if you're going to be doing a relative value trade, it still looks like the U.S. comes out fairly well relative to the rest of the world. What do you make of the fact that the United States is looking at even expanding the fact that BYD, Chinese EVs, can't get into the U.S., but Italy is contacting BYD to pr produce a facility in, in, in their own home front? This is not the multilateral approach that Biden was trying to take. It's not, and, but this is, this is a conversation which has come up so many years where Europe has to make its decision. Do you side with the US or do you side with China? And Europe, as we said, it's got pretty terrible fundamentals. Its long-term growth plan is not particularly strong. They need to be leaning into where there is going to be the best growth for it. And so I think that really takes precedence again. And Rita, before you go, can we can reflect on the good old days of 2020? There weren't many. August, September, when we were talking about this exact issue around bike dance and TikTok. And what on earth happened? We were all reflected on the fact that it came down to not Microsoft, it was Oracle and Walmart. And then it was like this, I don't know what to call it. What are we calling it? Kickback fee to the government, the Treasury, $5 billion? Yeah, and legal finders challenges. Fee. <laughs> it was a finder's fee, whatever it was. it was. It was kind of odd, that whole situation with the Trump administration and TikTok. Do we understand the former president's position on TikTok? What was that? four years ago. Four years ago, the president's position is ban TikTok, um, as, be as anti-China as you can possibly be. And it was very well documented. You know, you, you, you don't have to search for it. It's there. And now that has materially shifted. Um, and you have to pay attention to the president, the former president's verbiage here when he says, you know, me and the club for growth are back in love again. That, that was the exact quote. Um, it, it is to do with a $10 million donation back in June that saved Club for Growth via you know, one mega donor. And that has continued and now his position's totally shifted. We were all watching as Kellyanne Conway materially moved the needle with the president throughout his entire tenure in the White House. So to think that she's actively um, lobbying on behalf of this institution going out to 10, I believe it was 10 specific members, that's all it takes to get the Freedom Caucus to sink the bill. Now the bill is coming up under suspension of the rules. So if Democrats decide they want to pass it with Republicans, they 
Kellyanne Conway has her work cut out for her because you, it just takes two thirds of the conference to uh, pass the legislation. So uh, I think it is a hard thing to do, which is why I say, you know, see if it even comes up. If it comes up, it will pass. If it doesn't, that's how you kill it. Interesting. Just a major shift. Henrietta, good to see you. Thanks for the being. brilliant Henrietta Trace of Vader Partners together with the also brilliant Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management. Coming up on this program, Herman Chan of Bloomberg Intelligence, one year on from the collapse of SVB. That conversation up next, live from New York. This is Bloomberg. Coming off the back of a very rare week of losses on the S&P 500, we've seen so many weeks of gains on the S&P so far year today. In fact, since the end of October, equity futures on the S&P 500 right now negative by 0.15% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100. Softer by 0.2%. I'm sure lots of you would like an NVIDIA check. I think we could throw one up for you. NVIDIA right now in the pre-market looks a little something like this. Negative, again, actually, by about 1%. It was positive a little bit earlier after wild swings, Bramo in Friday's session. $300 billion of market value created and lost, if you look at the gyrations, just overnight, let alone the $250 billion lost in three hours on Friday. What's going on, right? I mean, this is ultimately the question. Is this the topping out of stocks that have gained, what, 100 million percent this year? I mean, it's been something more than 80 percent so far year to date. Pretty ridiculous on that name. So equity's a bit softer. We'll keep looking at NVIDIA for you. I want to look at bonds as well. Yields are higher by two basis points. Let's call this 450 at the front end of the curve on a two year. That is more than 20 basis points lower than where we were two weeks ago at the close today. Lisa, that's a big change in this bond market. And we were looking for the data to see if it would confirm the January boom. And last week's economic data, specifically in the labor market, did not confirm. It was specifically the revisions downward in the prior month that actually left the average at a lower pace than it would have been if the expectations were met. It was a two-pronged whammy, I think. On one hand, you also had Fed Chair Jay Powell coming out and not pushing back against some of the market action that we've seen so far. And then second, we've seen downside surprises, which really have come out to the welcoming of this market looking for Goldilocks. Goldilocks, let's get to higher rates and lack thereof over in Japan. I'm not sure if we can call it Goldilocks in Japan, but ultimately Japan is looking at hiking interest rates for the first time since 2007. Looking at the yen, five consecutive days of yen strength. The first time we've seen that since July of 2023, 146.70. I've lost count of the amount of reports that we've had over the last week. So let's try and add them up. One, here at Bloomberg, we had sources around the BOJ suggesting they're gaining confidence in the wage data. We had another story looking at sources around the government who suggested they were comfortable with hiking interest rates. And then in the Japanese press over the last couple of days, some suggestion maybe they'll give up yield curve control as well. So all of this is lining up big time, going into a really important piece of information later this week when we get the first feedback from one of the largest unions about wage negotiations in Japan and beyond and maybe that leads to a BOJ the next week hikes rates. It seems like the market consensus is that they're going to hike rates. Now the question is how much? Are they going to go to zero? Are they going to go zero to 0.25? Are they going to continue their bond and ETF purchasing programs considering they didn't buy ETFs overnight? The interesting thing is the markets are not freaking out. You're not seeing some massive disruption, which, again, they have an opening. Do they just drive through it? It's the interplay between the three central banks right now that I think is interesting. Seema Shah, Principal Asset Management, was with us just moments ago, and she was talking about the ECB and the limits at which the ECB could reduce interest rates if the Federal Reserve doesn't do much at all. One, that relationship. Then you've got the relationship between them and the BOJ. If they start reducing interest rates, does it give them a little bit more space in Japan to hike? Absolutely, because you don't have the same kind of runaway yields that could potentially happen if you have the rest of the world hiking rates. Are we going to look back and say Operation Ostrich was successful? That's really my key hey, question. Possibly, possibly. If you frame it in the following terms, that was a once-in-a-generation opportunity to reframe and really redo inflation expectations in Japan. That inflation was a welcome story in Japan and everywhere else it was not. Europe, the United States, in Japan it's what they've been looking for for decades and they embraced it. Now the question to me is just what is the implication for equities which in Japan have been running away given the fact that it might not be as cheap if you have dollars to go in there and buy? I think without a doubt Lisa that's the biggest question for a lot of people. They're two favorite sec sectors right now tech and what's happening with discretionary stateside. Two favorite regions, US, Japan. 
Japan off the back of dollar yen, which moved up to 150, then stayed there. So I said this earlier, can you make the argument that you need yen weakness for Japanese equities to perform well? I don't think you need to make that argument because this year we were basically at 150 all year and Japanese equities carried on ripping. I think the difficult part of this question is what happens when you start to see yen strength kick in again with the power that it has done over the last few days. If you go from 150 to 140, 130, 120, are you telling me that Japanese stocks are going to hold up in the face of that? Because overnight, they did not. I was going to say, overnight, if you're looking for a read, it wasn't necessarily positive. That's going to be sort of the key question for that favoured trade of 2024. Nikkei 225 today down by more than two percentage points. Under surveillance this morning, a top story. The Fed entering the quiet period ahead of next week's meeting, and they'll have plenty of data to digest. Tomorrow, we'll get February CPI coming off a hotter than expected January print, Thursday PPI, retail sales and jobless claims. And a question we asked on Friday, and I think we started this morning asking it again, just how dependable is this economic data after the wild revisions we just saw on Friday? The frustrating thing is Mohamed Alarian said that you need a roadmap because it all gets revised uh, you know, upward or downward, more often downward if you're talking about the jobs numbers. And yet they don't have a roadmap. So then what do you do with this data, right? I mean, you've got people basically gaming it out. CPI is going to be really important because ultimately, if you have weakness or you have strength, if you don't have inflation, it ultimately doesn't matter. Mohammed said on Friday that that data point, Anne-Marie, can mean whatever you want it to mean. And I think that's basically explains the market performance that we saw on Friday. Absolutely. It also explains what the administration was saying. I spoke to the acting Labor Secretary, Julie Su, who kept saying this just reinforces a soft landing. But the president has been touting this manufacturing gains. And yes, we have seen manufacturing jobs pick up, but not in the most recent labor report, down by negative 4,000 jobs. Where we saw the job growth is in state, federal, local government. That's the economic data. That's your week ahead, just to frame the week for you. Tomorrow morning, we'll get CPI. I just want to talk about the politics briefly as well. The latest from the president, President Biden, warning Israel against an attack on the southern city of Rafa as ceasefire talks stall. Biden had previously hoped to have a ceasefire by the beginning of Ramadan, but the Islamic holy month started at sundown yesterday, with negotiations remaining at an impasse. Israel has said it has to invade Rafa as it's the last bastion of Hamas. But Biden telling MSNBC over the weekend the assault would represent a, quote, crossing of a red line, Anne-Marie. There was really a nuanced approach Biden took. He wanted a little bit of showing support for Israel, but at the same time, a little bit of making sure he's showing support for the Palestinians and especially making sure that message was delivered to MSNBC and progressive left. So he said there is a red line when asked that question, but then he followed up immediately. But I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, but there's a red line when it comes to Palestinian lives. He said, I don't want to see another 30,000 Palestinians dead. Was that thrown together over the weekend? after some missteps in the State of the Union. Where did that interview come from? Um, potentially, it was put together on the fact that the president now viewed the State of the Union as the kickstart of the campaign trail. So he's going to have to start to engage with media a lot more. There was another part of that interview that potentially goes to this idea of what was this thrown together. He received a tremendous amount of pushback from the progressive left on the use of the word illegal when talking about that alleged immigrant that killed that young girl in Georgia when he had that moment at the State of the Union with Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. He was asked about it on Friday, and he didn't apologize. But then in the MSNBC interview, he said he regretted saying it. Is there a risk here that in entertaining the far left of the party is going to isolate the rest of the country? Well, at the same time, Biden sat down for that interview on Saturday. Former President Donald Trump was meeting with Lincoln Riley's family in Georgia. And they're saying the left is trying to have a debate about words and what they would call semantics, even though the president said it wasn't the correct word he used, while the right is talking about the fact that at the end of the day, this person allegedly murdered an American citizen. That's the latest from the president and the news down in Washington yesterday, marking the one year anniversary since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. The collapse leading to the worst month for the KPW banking index since the onset of the pandemic. Regional banks back in focus to begin 2024. New York Community Bank's exposure to bad commercial real estate loans sinking its stock. Last week, NYCB raising over $1 billion in equity, led by former U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. To weigh in on the last 12 months, Herman Chan, senior U.S. regional banking analyst over at Bloomberg Intelligence. Herman, let's talk about the last 12 months before we get into the next 12 months. Months. What have we learned and what have we changed? Sure. What have we learned? We've learned that regional banks that have an over-reliance or over-concentration in their business model really can lead to instability. We saw that with SBB with their interest rate risk within their securities portfolio. 
Now we're seeing it uh, more in real time with New York Community Bank with their concentration risk in, in multifamily real estate, particularly rent regulated apartment lending. So uh, the the rest of the larger regional banks have a more diversified business model, which uh, supports them with this uncertain uh, operating environment today. Herman, where are we on some of the regulations that were targeting some of the smaller mm -hmm. banks that have been highly contentious, I should say? Have they moved closer to reality or further away? Uh, it depends on which which regulation we're talking about. So with the Basel III endgame uh, rules uh, in flux, uh, given the comments from the Fed earlier, uh, we're, we're still waiting to see what the final rules could be. Uh, one thing is that the, the, we expect the endgame to incorporate the unrealized losses in, in the AFS securities portfolio within the capital calculation. So in that respect, we are closer to reality. We're still uh, waiting to hear other potential rules down, down the pike, uh, including uh, liquidity uh, potential ratios, which would address uh, the, the outflow issue that SBB faced last year. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion around consolidation and why we haven't seen more of it. There has been mm -hmm. a reluctance, but partly because a lot of transactions have not gone through. Do you have a sense right. of just how pent up the demand is to mm -hmm. consolidate? Should the regulatory environment be more amenable to that type of transaction? Yeah, I think one year after SVB, uh, an important lesson is that scale really matters. Um, you've heard that uh, most vocally from banks like PNC, uh, banks like U.S. Bank also ha have gained scale in recent years. And, and I, the industry is really watching what's going to happen with the Capital One Discover deal. Um, it, it, it's one of the largest deals that we've seen over the past few years. And, and if that uh, deal openly does get a regulatory approval, it could really open up the floodgates for more M&A over the next uh, several years. Herman, do you have any optimism, or what is your optimism that you actually think that deal goes through? Because the direction of travel in Washington has been to block these types of deals. Right. Uh, you have heard a lot of uh, consternation fr from the Democrats, uh, including uh, Senator Warren, in terms of the, the competition w involving credit cards. But in our view, uh, uh, our colleague Nathan Dean sees, sees a better uh, opportunity for, for uh, approval. And I would point to the fact that if we're talking about Visa and MasterCard, the two processors, it does potentially create a third player within that space that could open up more competition, which would be great for, for the economy and businesses in America. I'm going to appreciate the update. Herman Chan there of Bloomberg Intelligence. You think about where we were 12 months ago. No landing turned into hard landing, end of cycle type stuff. The Fed was going to have to cut interest rates. And here we are, Fed still at 5.5%. GDP growth is pretty decent. And we're not really talking about this issue anymore. People believe in the I word, idiosyncratic. That is right? basically what New York Community Bank showed us. And how long can idiosyncratic remain the story when you haven't necessarily seen the KW index recover materially? Is it just a profitability story that's being baked in. Can we get through this cycle without credit issues? If last year was a rate issue story, mismanagement of rates over at banks, which is the job and it didn't go so well, is this year going to be the year of credit issues? And so far, we're willing to look at a single entity like NYCB and, and use the I word for it. And I say we, I think the majority of the people that come totally. on this program. And a lot of people are saying it's because the maturity wall isn't necessarily coming to the fore yet. And frankly, with New York Community Bank, there were some specific rent control issues that have to do with New York City. That said, I keep going back to Howard Marks saying that next year is going to be when a lot of the maturities are going to come due. At what point do we start to see some of those higher rates bite in a more material way? It's just been very long and very variable lags. This goes back to that popular phrase used on Wall Street at the moment, can they survive until 2025? And we'll see. Equity futures on the S&P right now, negative by 0.2%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hakez. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Reddit and its investors are seeking to raise nearly $750 million in what would be one of the biggest IPOs so far this year. The company plans to offer 22 million shares priced between $31 and $34 each. That's according to a filing with the SEC. Reddit is seeking a listing on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker RDDT. More trouble for Boeing. Delta says it expects deliveries of its Boeing 737 MAX 10 aircraft 
could be pushed out to as late as 2027, as the plane maker faces more federal safety and criminal reviews. Delta CEO said yesterday it had expected to begin receiving the aircraft as soon as next year, but is now anticipating the delays. The airline has orders for 100 MAX 10 planes and options to purchase 30 more. In what could be a bad omen for Apple, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway sold just over 1% of its stake in the company last quarter. The last time Berkshire sold the stock between 2019 and 2020, the selling persisted for several quarters. Apple has been hit hard by a slew of negative news recently, including a $2 billion antitrust fine, slumping sales in China, and the scrapping of its decade-long car project. The stock is down 11% this year. And that's your Boomer Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. We'll catch up with you a little bit later. Up next on this program, looking ahead to this week's Big Data Point. They have done um, you know, a, a good job in terms of starting to get to a more normalized level of policy. I think interest rate cuts are still very much in the picture. The market's pricing in the summer, and I think that's quite reasonable. That conversation up next, live from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Stocks lower on the S&P 500, futures negative by 0.2%, pulling back just a touch. Yields up almost the basis point. No drama this morning, unchanged across the board. 4.08% on a 10-year, euro dollar going nowhere. 109.43, if you want some price action, I guess in foreign exchange, look to dollar yen. Five days of yen strength, plenty of speculation. They're going to be hiking maybe as soon as this month. Under surveillance this morning, looking ahead to this week's Big Data Point. They're mostly mostly focused around inflation. They think that they have done, um, you know, a, a good job in terms of starting to get to a more normalized level of policy. And they don't need inflation to be at target to start cutting interest rates. They can start normalizing monetary policy as the broader economy reaches a better balance. So to me, I think interest rate cuts are still very much in the picture. The market's pricing in the summer, and I think that's quite reasonable. So here's the latest, a key week of U.S. economic data coming right up, with tomorrow's February CPI report set to determine whether to add to bullish Treasury wages. Christian Mamani of Lafayette College writing this, the disinflationary trend continues, albeit slowly, which certainly helps the cause for the case for rate cuts. If there was a time to buy T-bills and chill, it wasn't last year when we all got excited. It's now. Krishna joins us right now in New York. Krishna, good morning to you. Um, good to see you. Why is it tea, bills and chill <laughs> right now? Well, so if you go back last, last year when everyone was getting excited about rates being at 5.5%, it was because we were on the verge of uh, equities doing fabulously well. I don't think that is the case. I, you know, if you boil things down, the U.S. economy continues to do really well. Inflation is slowing down. So the setup is perfect. Unfortunately, or fortunately, markets have kind of discounted all of that. So I, I think looking for uh, equity markets or risk assets to do fabulously well from here is pretty small. On the other hand, uh, you know, you, you get five and a half percent return on T-bills. So you can you can afford to wait. That uh, that's uh, that's interesting. You think we're on the precipice of equity market weakness, economic weakness or both? No, I, I don't think we are on the precipice of economic weakness or significant economic weakness, perhaps somewhat of a slowdown, but it's a slowdown that is very manageable. You know, nominal growth rate is still quite substantial. And at, at the end of the day, these are nominal instruments. So I don't think there's a uh, there's a big correction in the offing. It's just that a, a significant rally is not in the offing. Uh, that's that's really the difference. So when do you stop buying T-bills and just chilling? Well, so for, for that, you know, we, the, the probability of rate cuts, uh, you know, we are thinking of uh, June, but there's a whole lot of space between now and June. And the, we, we will probably have to work through that period before it becomes a, uh, comes a time for uh, uh, getting back into equities in a meaningful way. Don't you have FOMO? I mean, this seems to be what's driven so many people is just this feeling that they might miss out in the 80-something percent rally of NVIDIA. At what point does that look like a negative more than a positive? Uh, I, I think if you kind of look at it from an equity investor standpoint as opposed to an NVIDIA investor standpoint, 
uh, I, I know nobody what's wants to look at it. Yeah, but also what's nobody the difference? wants to look at it this way. But the <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, uh, equities have done well, but they haven't. Uh, the rest of uh, away from tech hasn't done spectacularly well. And there's an opportunity uh, in 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 that space if the economy continues to grow. And I think if there is going to be FOMO, it's really going to be about. U.S. economy remaining at this pace for a, on a very sustained basis than what we are probably thinking today. So T-bills and chill, there's a question of instead of what, right? Because if you still like big tech and you think that if there is the strength in the economy that would cause you to like T-bills in a rate that isn't going to go down that much, then you kind of want to be exposed to that as well, no? Well, yes. So I, I, I don't think it's basically saying that your equity exposure should be zero. It's just that this is probably not the time to be adding significant equity exposure is really the point I'm trying to make. That is, we are in a, 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 a sideways market for the time being. And in that environment, why take the risk when you don't have to? Because you can earn 5 say, five and a half percent and if you are adventurous, a little bit more than that. I certainly wouldn't frame you as a raging bear, not at all. No, I mean, last all. year, you joined me a few times and said the biggest risk was upside risk to equities. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a bit of a change for you. Yes. I want to talk about what Fed policy means for you and ultimately how it informs this view. So Governor Waller has said, what's the rush? Mm -hmm. President Kashkari has asked a similar question, why do anything? If they win the argument on the FOMC and this Fed does near to nothing this year, what does that mean for stocks? Where does it leave equities? Well, so I, I, I think that is really the question, and that is the, that the answer of uh, uh, T-bill and Chill is kind of deal with those types of uh, FOMC members. That is, uh, if you go back to what Waller was saying last year, late last year, he was basically far more rules-based. What came out of in, in, in January and February is that the U.S. economy is actually re-accelerating. So... He, like every good central banker, he wants to keep his options open. And that's what they are doing. I, I think the likelihood of them not cutting this year is basically zero, irrespective of what Torsten says. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think the likelihood of them being in a hurry to cut, yeah. I think that is pretty small as well. And that's the reason why the markets will probably remain sideways. Let's make Krishna Mamani the editor of some of those speeches at the Federal Reserve, OK? Friday's data... Now you get to revise some of the comments you've heard from Fed officials. Does any of it change at all? No, no. I, you know, I, I think if you look back at the uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony of, uh, uh, of uh, Chair Powell, it was basically the same thing that he gave in the presser. Nothing has really changed. In the U.S. economy, really nothing has changed. What, does, what may have changed slightly was the strength in the economy in the first two months of the year. But I think the employment report uh, probably kind of does away with that, and ISM and other things that probably do away with that as well. So the, the core strength is, is there, but it is not accelerating. As long as that is the case, I think for asset markets, what matters more, uh, how likely are they to raise rates? Or are they, and as long as that is not in the picture, I think we are all good. Why isn't the dollar stronger then? Well, the dollar is not stronger because I, I don't think uh, the likelihood of rates going up is meaningfully stronger. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of the driver of that is really, uh, you know, if, if the economy had continued on the pace that it was in January and February, I, I would have expected the dollar for the dollar to strengthen further. But I think subsequent data is kind of taking away that as one-off rather than as a, uh, something that is sustained. I wouldn't say it's the end of U.S. exceptionalism. I just wonder whether we've seen the peak of that story. If the growth inflation mix is going to improve in places like Europe, the UK, relative to what we've seen in the US. Well, so if, if you kind of look back at the, the US nominal growth rate, which matters more than anything else, I think it is exceptional. I, oh, without I, a doubt, but have it, we seen the peak oh, of well, that story? I, I, I think that's what matters to foreign exchange. Oh, ab absolutely. I, I think we have certainly seen the peak. The likelihood that we will go back and revisit the growth rates, the nominal growth rates that we had in 2021, 2022, I, I don't think that's in the cards uh, anymore. I wonder if that's a better way to think about it in foreign exchange at the moment, Lisa, that it can't get. The spread between Europe and the United States was already very, very wide. It's going to stay wide, but can it get wider? And I think that's the question we're trying to answer at the moment. And well, I guess so, uh, let me inter I'm, I'm sorry. Let me interject one. Don't worry, Krista, you jump in. Yeah. Take control of the show. <laughs> no, but the, the, the point is, I, I, I think expecting uh, Europe to keep up the same pace as U.S. In the, in the current context, I think that's probably unlikely. Yep. Can we uh, close the gap, though? 
Oh, yes, we can, clo clo we can close the gap, but for that gap closing will come for U.S. decelerating. There is not that much evidence of that well, at I'm the saying, moment. You know, ultimately, FX doesn't care how that gap closes, mm -hmm. who leads it. You've got to push that relative trade through foreign exchange, and it should mean the euro that's doing all right, right? Yeah, yeah I, I think European growth has been okay relative to how European growth was in the uh, over the last 10, 15 years. So I think that certainly supports uh, supports the case you're making Can for Europe. Lisa, ask a question now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, basically, he doesn't think that parity is likely. That's uh, sort of the takeaway here. Sort of sounds here, like. Right? Yes. I mean, basically, right? that's it's fairly. We priced. should get you on with Jeff Hugh, and then you can argue together. That would be in, fun. Throw in a bit of Torsten Slock as well. <laughs> Chris, I enjoyed this. It's good to see you, mate. As Thank always, you. Chris Thank Romani you. of Lafayette. College. Coming up, <laughs> David Salvi of Ancora, Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment, and we'll catch up with Bank of America and Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. A whole lot more still to come from New York City this morning. Good morning. The bar for the Fed to start to cut is largely from the inflation front, just showing continued moderation. Rate cuts are still very much in the picture. The market's pricing in the summer, and I think that's quite reasonable. I think they've got room to be very, very patient. It is very likely that you could see these rate cuts get pushed back. There is a cyclical recovery that's brewing in this economy, which may not support that May or June cut. The baseline remains two to three cuts this year starting in June. Hopefully now, we'll have less chatter about either a hike or no hikes this year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market is negative by a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Chairman Powell in last week's semi-annual testimony said he needs just a little bit more evidence. Well, he's going to get plenty of evidence this week. CPI, Lisa, PPI, retail sales, jobless claims, all on deck. CPI coming up tomorrow. It's the first one and arguably the biggest as we look at the potential for decelerating inflation. Will a decline in year-over-year -year, uh, CPI, when you strip out food and energy, falling to 3.7% from 3.9% be sufficient. That little extra boost to go and cut rates, say, maybe not this month, but maybe in June. The data over the last couple of months has whipsawed equity markets, but I have to say it hasn't rattled this Federal Reserve. They've stayed on message. As Krishna Mamani said moments ago, Chairman Powell hasn't changed his message from the news conference at the end of January to the semi-annual testimony just last week. Maybe some slight tweaks, a little bit on financial regulation for whatever that's worth. But ultimately, you've got people like Governor Wallace saying, what's the rush? President Kashkari saying, why do anything? They are unmoved by what we've seen in the last few months. And the market's been on a round trip trying to catch up with the Fed and then fighting back and then catching up once again. The key question for me is how much do they keep their statement of economic projections the same? And at what point does the market kind of fight back a little bit more and say, well, you know, Torsten Slock might have a purpose here to basically say no rate cuts this year, or as some people say, maybe that's not the case. I'm pleased you brought up the SCP because on the agenda next week, statement, news conference, SCP. In the SCP, basically that's where you get the outlooks from the Fed officials. AMH, that's going to be important. And I think most people we've heard from so far suggest there's going to be no change in that SCP from December to where we are right now. It is important not just for consumers and for investors, but also important for politicians, especially as in this election year, right? So they need to know where inflation is going, where the economy is looking. Um, Jonathan, I love the comment Biden made on Friday because not really going to move the needle, but it's kind of funny that he says, I bet your rates are coming down. It's pretty much what Jay Powell already said anyway, so it's not like he's saying the Fed's not independent. He said this publicly from that little known interest rate shop. Called the Federal Reserve, apparently. I just don't get why he would even weigh in on this. I know, They're going to cut whatever. rates. I mean, oh, honestly, just... does, this, does this feature in the American mind there that is people are thinking, oh, yeah, you're going to get in the Fed? There's no equivalence between what he said in that address and, and writing a letter directly in the same way that Senator Warren did. They're just not the same thing. No, just it's true. Whatever. But, okay. That's how I felt about it going into the weekend. I would just, agree with I, that. I just, you know, <laughs> if, if, if this is the height of interference in central bank independence... You'll take it? We'll take it. <laughs> whatever. I'm sure <laughs> the, Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve themselves would take it. If, that, if that's as far as he's going to go, and if we can even characterise that as interference in central bank I mean, independence... In fairness, I, to call it a little outfit, it's sort of like... <laughs> slightly okay, demeaning. Cute. Right, yeah. Slightly cute.
<laughs> All right. Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative by a third of 1% on the S&P. In the bond market, yields higher by two basis points now on a two-year, getting closer and closer to 450. Ten's not doing much, 4.08%. Euro doing nothing through most of this morning, 109.43 on that currency pair. Coming up this hour, coming up on the program, we'll catch up with Ancora's David Sowerby on what he calls the Fed's unprecedented monetary policy experiment. We'll speak to Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace on Biden red line for Israel. And we'll catch up with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow on the upcoming Reddit IPO. We begin with our top story, the stock market rally pausing ahead of the last big slate of data before next week's Fed decision. CPI, PPI and retail sales all on deck this week. US inflation likely only pulling back slightly in February with retail sales set to rebound, supporting the Fed's no rush rate cut view. Traders continuing to boost bets on a June rate cut. David Sabi of Ancora joins us now for more. David, great to catch up with you, sir. It's been too long. I want to go straight to the equity market and why you think we might be on the precipice of some downside here, maybe a sizable sell-off. Sure, Jonathan. In any calendar year, the average intra-year sell-off is about 14%. We haven't seen one in, in at least you know, nine months to a year. And while I think the tone of companies is still quite positive, especially with respect to their cash flow and free cash flow growth. Just the fact that more people are starting to weigh in that the Fed may not be as aggressive and as soon reducing interest rates, that could simply be the catalyst that sends stock prices down in the near term. And out of that, you'll have an opportunity to buy some better names that are down 15 percent or more. David, before we get to the buying opportunities, I know what led on the way up. Can you talk to us about what you think is going to lead on the way down? What's going to lead this sell-off? Market doesn't like uncertainty. We saw last at the end of last October that when the Fed blew the whistle and said, get back in the pool, we're thinking more about interest rate cuts, markets responded quite well. Now that we're beginning to see some news that inflation is not quite at, at the tame level you want it to be, I think that's what potentially takes the market down 10%, maybe a touch more. So you think that basically people are concerned about rates being too high for too long and that, that stocks really just have not woken up to that fact yet. Is that correct? I, I think the market got a bit ahead of itself, anticipating at one point we're talking about six interest rate cuts. That, that I think, was absurd, wasn't going to happen. So we know the market can be a little bit of uh, schizophrenia in the near term, and that's maybe what's going to face the market. But I'll still take a step back and say, last week I was at an investor conference. 300 publicly traded companies were presenting. I thought the tone was was uh, quite good, B, B minus, with respect to companies. And they're still generating a lot of free cash flow that if you get this sell off, it'll be a buying opportunity. We just had Krishna Mamani on and he was talking about T-bills and chill, that basically it's not a concern for him about reinvestment risk of just staying in T-bills at a time when people are expecting the Fed perhaps to stay a, a little bit higher for longer and there could be this sell-off. Is that kind of how you think about it right now as well, that basically it's a time to stay in T-bills and wait for that downdraft before entering? I think if you look over the next year to two years, Cash is not going to cut it. You might get it. You might get excited about a five percent yield, but I'll take a step back and say, if absent a near-term hiccup in the markets, stocks still represent the best place, particularly U.S. stocks. If you want to compound your wealth at eight percent or better, uh, we know the bond market year to date is flat to down one half of one percent because we're seeing what happens when interest rates go higher. I don't see a lot of excitement in, in pockets of the bond market or even cash. David, how relevant is monetary policy to your equity market call? You've referred to this period of monetary policy as some kind of grand experiment. How relevant is it and has it been? It's, Jonathan, it's an experiment that we're still not out of the laboratory yet. We, we, we had M2 money growth accelerate to better than 25 percent year over year. Then in the last 15 months, we've seen negative M2 money supply growth. We haven't seen that in more than 40 years, 50 years. So we're still in this monetary experiment that the Fed put us in out of COVID. It was good for them to be stimulative. They simply stayed at the party too long. And I think the Fed is a little bit embarrassed. There aren't enough monetarists at the Fed, and we're still living through this experiment. 
yet to be played out on inflation and interest rates. David, it's amazing what we've seen in four years. We've seen both record low interest rates and interest rates at multi-decade highs over the period of just a few years. And David, what we've seen happen in the banking sector is they've been whipsawed by that. Banks that failed to really manage that interest rate risk. That was last year's story. What we're trying to figure out is if there is credit risk around the corner. Is that this year's story or, David, next year's story? Uh, credit risk is probably a year out, particularly for those Look at the private equity sector that is more of a floating rate borrower. That's where I think the trouble is. Good companies two to two and a half years ago were good at extending their debt, floating rate to fixed rate debt, extending the debt tranches out further. I think that's been that's been quite positive in the face of this monetary experiment. So when it comes to that holy trinity, I think the balance sheet would, was too long ignored. Now it's front and center. And I think companies have done pretty good job at managing their balance sheet and their interest rate risk here. If monetary policy was an unprecedented experiment, fiscal policy really kind of tries to rival that in many ways over the past few years. And I'm curious about how you maneuver around a fiscal policy that's bolstered certain aspects. I'm thinking of electric vehicles. I'm thinking of industrial stocks at a time when some people are questioning how that'll play through. How do you factor that in when you try to decide whether to pick up the pieces of some of the areas that have kind of fallen out of bed recently? Lisa, I've always, I've always thought, I might have an opinion on the Federal Reserve and God forbid try to forecast interest rates, but, if, but in the 30 stock portfolio that I co-manage, I've always operated under expect government to do the least amount to fix a problem. That's probably been the best rule of thumb for managing a portfolio in the face of what's been disappointing fiscal stimulus or fiscal discipline. So we're and, and it's going to continue. So are you saying that the industrial policy, the money that a lot of people are saying is going into different areas that they're trying to follow, are you saying that that's been overpriced? To some extent, we saw it with, uh, with the auto industry, uh, the, uh, the, the excitement over electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, that, that started to ebb a little bit as people are still want their internal combustion engine and they're not willing to give it up. So that picking the winners and losers in industrial policy, it always sounds very good at the beginning. And you look at it after after the outcome. And more often than not, government has not done a good job at picking winners and losers, as opposed to the marketplace and the millions of investors every day who vote with their dollars. The central planning never ends well. David, thank you, sir. David Sabi, Vancouver, appreciate thank your time. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo says the U.S. could further tighten controls on China's access to chip technology. Raimondo telling reporters, quote, we cannot allow China to have access for their military advancement to our most sophisticated technology. Raimondo adding the U.S. will do whatever it takes to keep Chinese firms from accessing U.S. chip information. Her comments come as the Biden administration also also weighs sanctions on several Chinese companies in order to curb the nation's development of semiconductors. At least 50 people have been injured after a mid-air incident on a LATAM flight from Sydney to Auckland. The Boeing 787-9 aircraft experienced a technical problem which caused strong movement on, on board, according to New Zealand Herald reporting. About a dozen people were taken to hospital, including one patient in serious condition. Oppenheimer has picked up a total of seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director for Christopher Nolan. Barbie's eight nominations amounted to one trophy for the best song in a night that saw Hollywood's old guard return to glory amid disappointment for streaming companies. Disney's Poor Things won four awards, including Best Actress for Emma Stone, beating Lily Gladstone, who was in line to become the first Native American to win an Oscar for her role in Apple's Killers of the Flower Moon. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Robert Downey Jr. was so good in that movie. He was. I watched that whole movie and couldn't work out, didn't figure out that it was Robert Downey Jr. until the very end of the movie. I know. He looked so old. Phenomenal. <laughs> but honestly, he was such a good actor. I got to say, it's a fantastic movie. It really was, both from a dramatic perspective, but also just sort of a, a philosophical perspective as well. Well deserved. Can we just say it was well deserved? 100%. I know everyone likes to frame the Oscars as some left-wing conspiracy theory, <laughs> some woke agenda to reshape society and all of that stuff. But like Oppenheimer was just the best movie. 
It, uh, I, hands down. Hands down. I mean, do, do people really think that Barbie should have won instead? I've seen both. Not a fan. Some people do. No, come on. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Even put them together is sort of ridiculous. Some people do. I'm going to get some hate mail. Up next on this program, Biden's red line oh for Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons, but there's red lines that if he crosses and you cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. That conversation up next. Session lows here on the S&P 500, negative by 0.5%, pulling back just a little bit. We're looking at NVIDIA. NVIDIA was all over the place in Friday's session. It was positive 5%, negative 5%. That stock is down by another eight tenths of 1%, Lisa. So just a little bit of weakness kicking in to the equity market. What do you make of the volatility, though? I mean, it's been all over the place. Is there a signal there, or is it just all noise? Hard to say. Uh, that's all I can say. Is it's hard to say. All I can say is we've had a monster run-up into Friday. I think it was six days and another 19%. And 20% of a couple of trillion is a lot of money. But that, I think, is the big takeaway for me. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars of market capitalizations gained or lost like that. How does that work going forward if that really has been one of the main drivers of the rally that we've seen in the S&P 500? That is the modern day equity market in 2024. Just single names, whipsaw and everybody. That's NVIDIA. In the bond market, yields are higher by, let's call it two basis points. The two-year, around 450. Under surveillance this morning, Biden's red line for Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses, and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the, with, with the trauma caused by Hamas. It's the latest this morning. President Biden slinging his harshest criticism yet as Israeli Prime Minister Benj Benjamin Netanyahu. Divisions growing over the next phase of the war in Gaza as both sides fail to reach agreement on a ceasefire before the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace joins us now for more. Aaron, I asked this question a little bit earlier this morning. And thank you for being with us, sir. I want to ask it of you. Do you believe there is a real split taking place between these two leaders? Or is this a convenient media narrative to benefit the president here domestically? No, I think it's real. Uh, I think anger and frustration on the part of the administration is growing. I don't think we're on the cusp of a public breach. The problem is that with no hostage for prisoner release deal, uh, the battlefield dynamic is laid threadbare for all to see. Hamas is using tunnels and time to create mining pressures inside Israel and externally from the United States on the Netanyahu government. And Benjamin Netanyahu is determined to pursue uh, an operation in Rafa to destroy tunnels and probably uh, to destroy where he believes the senior Hamas leadership is. So, no, it's very real. The question is, can it be managed? And frankly, I, I think the president's going to have to make a decision whether he wants to make a point or whether he wants to make a difference. If he wants to make a difference, I'm not sure he's going to he has much choice. But to work with the Israelis, he can create red lines for them. But he's going to have to ultimately work with them because without Israeli acquiescence, this is going to go on and on and on, and it will take a toll on the president. It's already taking a toll on the president's election prospects. Well, Aaron, did he actually create a red line? Because he seemed to create multiple red lines and also said, after he said there is a red line when it comes to Gaza, he went on to say that he still supports Israel. They're not going to try to take away any of those weapons. The Wall Street Journal editorial this morning says, as in often the case, it's hard to tell what Mr. Biden means. What do you I think mean, he meant? American red lines often turn pink, frankly, when it comes to Israel. There's no question about it. Look, Joe Biden's caught in his own investment trap. He has a profound commitment emotionally, politically, to the idea of Israel, the people of Israel, the security of Israel, not so much, obviously, the Netanyahu government. I, I, by the same token, he's watching a humanitarian disaster in Gaza where the Israelis clearly could do more, much more, uh, to facilitate that. And again, we're reaching a, a point, if, if Hamas can't yield and tunnels and time really do work to their advantage, the Israelis are going to continue to pursue that operation, and that's going to lead invariably 
to a disproportionate number of Palestinian casualties. So I think we're in for a bad patch in the U.S.-Israeli relationship. I don't think we're uh, on the cusp of a fundamental breakup. We have that hot mic moment from Biden saying he's going to have this, quote, come to Jesus meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. Do you expect President Biden to have to maybe travel to Israel? You know, there's been talk of the president going to Israel uh, in an effort uh, to talk over the heads of the Israeli government to address the Knesset. I think that's a very risky strategy. And the reality, I think, for the administration is this is not just the Netanyahu government. The Israeli public, 90 percent of them, either believe that enough force is being applied by their government in order to try to crush and eradicate Hamas, or, or they want to do more. So I think the blood is up in Israel. Clearly, the hostage families are pressing the other way for, for an agreement. But a major, a major confrontation between the U.S. and Israel, in my judgment, will not bring back those voters who are disillusioned and fleeing from Joe Biden. But it, it offers absolutely no end, no way to de-escalate this conflict. And that's the bind that uh, Joe Biden's in right now. There's also a question of what exactly is going on. It seems like Hamas pulled out or took a really hard line at the last minute of these negotiations. Where is the pressure coming from, from the likes of Qatar, Saudi Arabia, even Iran, uh, that really seems to, seem, uh, to want to uh, de-escalate the conflict with the U.S.? You know, I've argued from the beginning, in an existential conflict, when both Israel and Hamas believe their vital national interests are at stake, particularly for Hamas, which, in fact, for the senior leadership, it is an existential issue. It's very difficult. We often forget this. It's very difficult for outside parties. The Middle East is littered with the remains of great powers that believe wrongly they could impose their will on smaller ones. And this is just another example of that. No, you'll get an agreement when, in fact, there's enough urgency on the part of Israel and Hamas to achieve one. But clearly, we haven't reached that point yet. When do you think we could potentially see the United States inject something for not, not an agreement for long term, but this ceasefire? Because Biden over the weekend said that Bill Burns was back in the region and it was just a week ago that president was hopeful we would see that ceasefire. Well, it's been over a week now. Right. And Middle East negotiations, based on my long experience, mostly in failure, I might add, it, Middle East negotiations have two speeds, slow and slower. So on this one, again, it's going to be driven in large part by the battlefield dynamic. And when, in fact, um, Israel and Hamas believe that it is that that the risks of continuing this conflict are outweighed by the prospects of a limited ceasefire in order to re-up, rearm and prepare for the next phase. And can I just finish with a bigger question regarding the United Nations? What do you think the future of the U.N. actually is now? Is it fit for purpose? Uh, the UN as an organization? Yeah. I think it, you know, in, in, in limited ways, it can have an impact in peacekeeping and providing humanitarian assistance. But the UN is only as strong as the, as strong as the five permanent members of the Security Council. And at no time in recent years do I think you've had a more fraught and divided uh, great power competition, which clearly pits China and Russia as more or less a bloc against the other three permanent members of the Security Council. So I don't expect much from the UN. It reflects more than drives, frankly, um, what the state of the world really is or, or, or anyone's effort to fix it or repair it. That is certainly true today. Aaron, thank you, sir. Aaron David Miller okay. of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. It's two very different answers that we've got to the very same question in the last couple of hours. Is this a real split between these two leaders or a convenient media narrative? to serve the president of the United States domestically who's facing pressure, Lisa, from his own party. And there we heard from Aaron David Miller that it's an actual split earlier this morning from Terry Haynes. He said, uh, not so much. It's more of a media narrative. The key question is, what can the U.S. do about it? What can President Biden really do if there is this split, given that ultimately we've seen the limits of the U.S. ability to control uh, Israeli politics? Remember, at the start of Biden's administration, he did put some distance between him and Benjamin Netanyahu. They came out strongly with the Israeli people when the judicial review was happening, but then he went to Israel and gave Benjamin Netanyahu this bear hug. I'm still struck about Benny Gantz coming to the United States. Prime Minister Netanyahu told him, remember, there's only 1 p.m. in Israel. The officials I spoke to said we didn't invite him, but he still met with U.S. officials. There was another piece that interested me over the weekend. The president said there was other ways to deal with the, hammer, the, the trauma caused by Hamas in October, on October 7th, and they didn't offer the prescription. What are the other ways? What are they? 
I don't know. And I think that there is a real lack of understanding of what the cohesive plan that President Biden is putting forward if he wants Israel to take another tack, especially, yes, there is this uh, peer in terms of delivering humanitarian aid. What's the rebuild? A lot of questions. Yeah, I'd certainly like some more clarity on the president on that issue. Coming up next on the program, Aditya behalf of Bank of America Securities previewing this week's economic data. CPI coming up tomorrow, then later in the week, it's retail sales, PPI and jobless claims. More still to come. This is Bloomberg. Session lows on the S&P 500, negative here by zero. 0.4% on the Nasdaq pulling back just a touch as well. A little bit softer on the Nasdaq 100. We're down by 0.6%. One eye and on video all morning. We're negative by 0.8% after the wild swings of Friday's session. Nvidia right now is negative 0.84%, Lisa, after being positive a little bit earlier by something like 1.5%. How many notes uh, were there over the weekend, or countless that I read, where people were basically saying this is the signal of the beginning of the end of the Magnificent Seven, that the splintering is going to continue and that this is going to be the next downdraft because people are clearly getting nervous. I don't know. I mean, we've said this before, but there is this exhaustion that's playing in with a new type of trading activity. And I think that maybe overnight and on Friday is what you were saying. Can't blame the bond market for it, at least not last week, because yields were lower on the week on a two year and on a 10 year. This morning, a little bit higher at the front end of the curve, up by three basis points, 450, 46, unchanged on a 10 year maturity, 4.07. 88%. The data this week will inform the Federal Reserve decision, maybe not next week, but ultimately over the next couple of months. The chairman wants more data. He's going to get more data and more evidence through the week. We'll talk about that in just a moment. I want to talk about another central bank decision, and it's the BOJ in the next week. Yen strength, the story here. Dolly yen, 146.83. We've had five days of yen strength. Dolly yen, negative again by 0.16%. We've had story after story suggesting they're getting ready to go, Lisa, and hike interest rates for the first time since. 2007. The biggest surprise may not be whether or not they go. The biggest surprise may be how much they go, whether they just go to zero or whether they go to 0.25 percent, whether they indicate further type of retrenchment from negative rate policies. That might be the way that the market is kind of uh, characterizing this next move, because right now it seems like it's all but certainty they're going to walk through the door. And what they do with yield curve control. They're still going to pin yields at zero percent and raise rates at a short end. I, I wonder. You know, the Bank of Japan and Japanese policymakers not known for making dramatic waves. So it seems unlikely that they're going to completely upend everything that they've done over the past decade. That said, a lot of people are wondering how far can they go in normalizing a policy that has been anything but for the better part of several decades. Not known for clear communication sometimes as well. They might consider that to be a feature and not a bug and that's up to them. But there was a great write up for the team at Bloomberg on the history of negative interest rates. And it was just this one snippet. And I remember it at the time when the BOJ at the time, Governor Kuroda, basically declined to say that he would do anything with negative interest rates, in fact, pushed back against it. And then days, weeks later, that's exactly what they did. So I'm not sure how much you can take from recent communication from the BOJ. That suddenly they're going to surprise, shock and awe everybody. It worked then. Does it work to surprise the market in this way? They have moved very slowly so that they didn't cause a surge in yields. And that, I think, is really the key and the reason why people haven't really moved around as much as you might think. Dolly Yen, 146.79. The Nikkei 225 had a tough session overnight. Under Savannah's this morning, our top stories, Boeing's problems continue. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg telling Fox News that Boeing will face enormous scrutiny over the door panel blowout on a January Alaska Airlines flight. First of all, Boeing needs to cooperate in every respect, and the FAA has given them 90 days to show a comprehensive plan on how they're going to turn their quality issues around. That means an enormous amount of rigor uh, in dealing with Boeing, in dealing with any regulatory issue, and that's exactly what FAA is doing. The DOJ launching a criminal investigation of the Alaska Airlines incident. Alaska saying it's fully cooperating and Boeing saying in a letter to Congress it can't locate records of work performed on the door. Delta Airlines saying it expects deliveries of the MAX 10 aircraft to be delayed until 2027 as Boeing undergoes its criminal and regulatory investigations. I keep saying this every single week, every time we hear about this story. It just gets worse. I'm really struck by the fact that they can't find that documentation because in the airline industry, every single thing needs to be documented. And that's incredibly embarrassing when they're looking into what happened on the Alaska Airlines flight. And then also just a few hours ago, it's the 787 Dreamliner that's in focus, a technical fault, leaving Australia 
to New Zealand, and at least a dozen people are in the hospital. So to your point, Jonathan, it just keeps get getting worse for this company. Uh, Lisa, they can't get away from the hits. It's story after story. And the fact that there's a criminal investigation, right? I mean, basically, Alaska Air came out and said, in an event like this, it's normal for the Department of Justice to be conducting an investigation. We're fully cooperating and do not believe we are a target of the investigation. So who is? There's just nothing normal about the whole thing over the last few months. Let's turn to our next story, TikTok under fire, this time from President Biden. Biden saying he will sign a bill passed by the House that would force TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance to divest it or risk its removal from U.S. app stores. Lawmakers have cited TikTok as a national security concern since the Trump administration. ByteDance also denying reports that it's been approached by potential TikTok buyers, including the former Activision Blizzard CEO. So the president going hard on TikTok literally on TikTok campaigning. I mean, <laughs> that's that's the thing about this story. It's, it's a little bit of hypocrisy in the sense that on government phones, including if you work in the White House, you cannot have TikTok downloaded. But the campaign has decided we're going to use TikTok if you have to reach the youth. But Biden is saying that there is this bill that's circulating in Congress. It passed a key committee. It's set to go to the floor vote this week on Wednesday. And what he is saying that if it passes Congress, I'm going to sign it. The other flip flop of this story is the Trump administration over the weekend. Former President Trump saying that, signaling that uh, actually we don't want to ban TikTok, so we'll give more weight to Facebook, and we don't like Facebook. But a lot of this actually, I think, has to come down to potential donors that he's trying to reel into his election campaign. Either it's national security or it's not. And I have to say that's about the chips, that's about this, that's about a lot of electric vehicles. Either it's national security and make an argument for that, or it has to do with jobs and competition and a question around, I don't know, who you want to put your money behind. It is two different things, and they have to make it clear and consistent. Otherwise, it's going to get caught up in legal challenges, and it's going to get caught up in all sorts of challenges. This right here is a great example as why many of this country are disappointed with the choice they've got to make in November. You've got the hypocritical approach coming from the White House and President Biden. I'll sign it if they pass it. I'll also campaign on it in the meantime, one. You've got President Donald Trump's argument, which makes no sense whatsoever. I still don't really understand it, because if you sell TikTok to Microsoft, guess what? Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook is not going to be happy about that, Lisa. I think that's pretty obvious, isn't it, AMH? Well, the fact of the matter is, I think President Donald Trump, former president, was talking about if it was banned. But yeah, if you sell it, TikTok still exists, just in a different form. What TikTok continues to try to do, what they say they want to do, is just siphon off the data for U.S. users in the United States, which they have been doing, trying to set up with Oracle. But at the moment, it doesn't seem like that has been enough to assuage concerns of Congress. The issue for the former president is, let's come down to it, it's Jeff Yass. This donor that at the moment was on the sidelines for him, he has over $30 billion stake in TikTok. And President Trump recently called him, quote, fantastic. So this is about money. This is not about policy at all. This, this is about raising to, money. This seems to be about raising money and what is good for some of these donors. And you have to look at the war chests of Trump versus Biden right now. Biden is out spending him and out delivering those, that money that's coming in from donors. And that's the latest on TikTok. I promise no more today. All right. A parade of economic data coming up this week. CPI, PPI, retail sales all coming ahead of the Fed's decision next week. U.S. inflation likely only pulling back slightly last month, with retail sales expected to rebound, emphasizing why the Fed is in no rush to cut. Traders continuing to boost bets on a June rate cut. Joining us now is Aditya Bahav, the senior economist at Bank of America Securities. Aditya, good to see you. Good morning. Thanks, Thanks for being with us. I picked up a line in your research and it was resilience, not reacceleration. How important is it not to see signs of reacceleration in that payrolls report on Friday? Oh, it was very, very helpful. And in fact, the CPI report is probably the most important one in my career on Wall Street. We have three tenths on the core, four tenths on the headline, but the details really matter. So the concern last month was reacceleration in services. And we're looking for about five tenths on core services with OER coming back down to rental inflation. So that's going to alleviate some of those concerns, but it's still too high for the Fed's comfort. So then the question will be how much of that reads into PCE, which we'll get a better sense of once we get the PPI data on Thursday. The Chairman Powell says he needs a bit more evidence. Is that one report, two or three? Do we have a number? It's probably going to be a few. I don't think it's just one. 
A few is two or three. <laughs> what is that in the Fed speech? A few is three, we, couple we, is two. A few is three, couple is two. Thank you. Three? We have the first hike in June, so they will okay. have three more CPI prints, four more before There we then. go. That's yeah. up. Well, but, but here's the thing. You just said that it's the most important CPI report in your career. Yep. And yet the data has been revised. It's been messy. We haven't had any consistency. And we need more than one to really show a trend. Why is this one data point going to be so important? Because the moves in January were so outsized. We had several months where inflation was trending in the right direction in a pretty broad manner. Then you had services reaccelerate in February, and you also had this issue with OER, right, where OER inflation diverged significantly from rental inflation. If that persists, we're in a lot of trouble. The Fed can't look through it. Right? But if it doesn't and OER moves back towards rental inflation, then rent is actually going in the right direction, which will be very helpful. We've been asking this question about the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve, and it seems like they are not concerned, uh, as concerned about inflation as continuing the economic growth that we have continued. What's sort of the trigger point where suddenly they have to think about the no rate kite situation in 2024? Well, oh, I think they are quite concerned about inflation. There's a reasonable risk that they don't cut this year or they're not able to cut through maybe December. It's not our base case, of course. We have the first cut starting in June. But as these, if, if you get more of these inflation numbers similar to January, then I think those risks increase, which again gets back to the importance of this, this inflation print, right? We need to know how much was one off. How concerned are you about the rising gasoline prices? I think that's second order for the Fed. Gas prices are still relatively contained by recent historical standards, so they're much more focused on the core. But if they were to reaccelerate, especially going to the peak driving season in, in the summer, isn't that very concerning, given the fact that gasoline feeds into everything else that the Fed's looking at as well with inflation? Right. So the key issue with gas is that sometimes it drives inflation expectations. It's a relatively small component of consumer spending, but it has an outsized effect on inflation expectations. So then if you see expectations stick up like they did a little bit in 2022, then I think the Fed will get a lot more concerned. We were just talking earlier with Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup, and he was saying that he expects a sudden turn about mid-year, where suddenly the growth that we've seen tapers off and becomes true weakness. How likely do you see that, given the consistency if not necessarily acceleration of the resilience in the economic data. That isn't our base case. We've seen a significant resilience both on the consumer side and on the CapEx side. For the consumer, we really think the first order driver of consumer strength is the labor market. The labor market is delivering strong gains in real income. Another thing you can look at, which I think is really useful, is um, airport traffic. That's a very discretionary form of spending. It's about 6 or 7% up consistently this year from last year's levels. And that's an inflation-adjusted number, right, because it's people flying. And that comes with other forms of discretionary spending. What do people do when they fly? They eat at restaurants. They spend on hotels. They spend on entertainment. So all of that makes us pretty confident about the consumer. They drink lots of alcohol as well. You've seen that in the mornings. I still don't understand that. <laughs> it's OK the, if you're the, flying. Like the pre-8 a.m. drink. There's literally. no rules at the airport. Well, it's basically yeah, exactly. 5 o'clock somewhere. No yeah. rules at the airport. People sleeping on, you know, benches, drinking at 6 a.m. I see that in London all the time at Heathrow, just pints. Pints before the plane at 7 a.m. in the morning. If you think about it, it is 5 p.m. somewhere, and it's that much more prevalent in your mind when you're traveling somewhere where it could be 5 p.m. It's like TK's rules. <laughs> Vacation starts at the airport. <laughs> I'd go to the airport lounge for TK. I'd say exactly the same thing. We're not doing this. How many people are traveling? Drink at like 11, 10, 30. How many people travel for status? Did you see the story in the What's Wall Street that? Journal what about how it? that's splitting families, that basically some people are and getting status go with different and, airlines. and basically, would you ever get upgraded and then kick your other person back? I've told my Matt Miller story, right? I've told it a few times. You know what Matt Miller did? <laughs> Kicked his wife into the back, put his dog next to him. <laughs> On a transatlantic that flight. That's a big dog, though. On a transatlantic so flight. A big seat. Business class. That's dog next to him. <laughs> wife in the back with the cats. Do, deal True breaker. story. Deal breaker. True story. Deal breaker. Did you, before you go, no. forgive me for going on that little, <laughs> that little tangent about Absolutely airports. Not. Can we finish on <laughs> discretionary spending? You've got yep. loads of credit card data, stacks of it. Yep. What's it telling you and the team about retail sales this week? So we don't have an official forecast on retail sales yet. We do have daily data that we've published for February. It looks a little bit soft, to be honest. It's still going to be a bounce back from January. January was distorted by seasonal factors. It looks a little bit soft. We're, again, we're not concerned broadly about the resilience of the consumer for the reasons that I just cited, though.
Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. It's good to see you. Aditya Bahav there of Bank of America Securities. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. And what could be a bad omen for Apple? Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway sold just over 1% of its stake in the company last quarter. The last time Berkshire sold the stock between 2019 and 2020, the selling persisted for several quarters. Apple has been hit hard by a slew of negative news recently, including a $2 billion antitrust fine, slumping sales in China, and the scrapping of its decade-long car project. The stock is down 11% this year. Bank of America plans to expand its commodity energy transition business, a move it says will require additional headcount. The bank is expanding its presence in global gas and energy markets, plus in environmental products, as more clients look to reduce their carbon footprint. BlackRock has identified energy transition as a mega economic force that's already driving markets and economies. Choice Hotels is ending its attempt to acquire Wyndham Hotels, saying it doesn't see a path forward and now plans to focus on its standalone strategy. The proposed takeover faced pushback in Washington, D.C., with Senator Elizabeth Warren saying it would lead to higher hotel rates and urging the FTC to investigate. Combining Choice's 7,500 hotels with Wyndham's 9,000 would have created a giant player in the world of budget hotels. That's your Bloomberg Reef. John? Yahara, thank you. AMH, are we going to have a record this year? for deals that weren't completed. Well, there was a record last year in terms of how aggressive the FTC, the DOJ was regarding antitrust. I just, you know, think every single deal that comes before Washington, so far yet, I haven't seen Elizabeth Warren say that she doesn't want to look more into that or she doesn't want the deal to go through. Is there a deal that they do like in Washington? Does one exist? It's very, very small and it's not right? across our desk. One that we're not talking exactly. about. Exactly. Just headlines that don't matter. <laughs> Up next on this program, Reddit preparing to bring a monster IPO to market. We have a tremendous amount of companies on the road. We have a tremendous amount of companies that we're working with at the moment to tap the public market. So we're really excited about the prospects for 2024. That conversation up next, live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Stocks right now on the S&P 500, a little lighter, softer, negative, down by a half of 1%. Going into the opening bell, 52 minutes away, your bond market basically unchanged, 4.08%. Under surveillance this morning, Reddit preparing to bring a monster IPO to market. We have a tremendous amount of companies on the road. We have a tremendous amount of companies that we're working with at the moment to tap the public market. So we're really excited about the prospects for 2024. Really, volatility is what's going to, I would say, impact the IPO markets. But for the short to medium term, I think we're going to see some good IPOs. Well, here's the latest. Reddit filing for an IPO seeking to raise as much as $748 million, making it one of the biggest offerings so far this year. The company looking to offer 22 million shares priced between $31 and $34 each. Reddit first attempting a public offering in 2021, raising enough money to give it a valuation of $10 billion at the time. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joins us now for more. Ed, great to catch up with you, buddy, going into this one. What is the difference between the scene now, the landscape for Reddit, versus where we were a few years ago? Yeah, kind of that they missed the boat, really. I mean, when they did their confidential filing in 2021, that was a record year for the IPO market in this country. And they're, they're a great case study of what a number of private technology or social media companies went through, which is... Uh, if, even if you listed in the last 18 months or so, you face the prospect of, of either raising funds in a down round to give you more potential upside in an IPO, or you just got the timing wrong. So even at the higher end of the range, right, $34 a share, on a shares outstanding basis, it's a $5.4 billion valuation, fully diluted $6.4 billion. But you're right to flag their last private round at $10 billion, which, you know, in Silicon Valley or elsewhere, it's, it's kind of unpalatable to go through that process, but it does leave you some upside, especially if you have a retail investor interest in, in a name like this. And we talk more often in equity markets about Reddit users and certain yeah. boards and their positions on names. I find this really interesting. How do the Reddit users feel about the so-called Reddit IPO? 
Uh, it's it's a it's a love hate situation. So you know, eight percent of the shares on offer will go to Reddit users or moderators, and the the pitch uh, in the memos that were sent out to those redditors is like, look at this. You can get in on an IPO on on in a para, on a sort of parity basis with the big Wall Street investors. This one's for you, but it's only eight percent of the offering. Uh, you won't be surprised to know, John, that there is actually a Wall Street bets forum post that was upvoted significantly where a number of Reddit users are advocating for the shares to be shorted as soon as they start trading. And, and that's actually not a surprise. You know, Redditors have been very vocal and active against the platform in things that they don't like. And, and as you know full well, it extends well beyond Reddit name itself in a lot of what we saw in the meme craze of 2020, 2021. Well, do they think of it sort of a selling out? I guess that's the question. Is it sort of now gone from underdog to overdog, and this would necessarily be something that, that kind of makes them not enjoy it as much? Yeah, I, I think it's also really important to note that Reddit is, is a classic advertising-based social media platform. And the, the, the user base is highly engaged, right? They're not interested in the ads. They're interested in the very specific subject line or topic that they're debating and upvoting. But to your point, kind of on the, on the broader investor interests in markets, I think it's also worth reminding the audience that Reddit's really quite small. You know, 71 million or so active users as of the data we have for the fourth quarter. Revenue did grow this uh, in 2023 for the full year to around $900 million, a loss of about $90 million. But you compare that with, with the scale of all of the meta platforms uh, with TikTok, which you guys were discussing earlier, it's very small. Yeah. And so you have to ask, well, if it's going to grow, why? What is it that advertisers see in it that they don't see in other platforms? Which raises this question of whether this is cashing out when there's just a window and whether there are other tech companies that have been waiting for a window to cash out to get an IPO done. And this is it. Are we going to see more of this type of activity? Well, that's why I said earlier, Lisa, that it's an interesting case study. So, so Reddit is almost like a starter gun. Remember back in September when we had the ARM IPO, it was almost like a starter gun for some other names, Clavio, for example. Um, there are other names waiting in the uh, wings, like Rubrik, that will look at this Reddit IPO and say, OK, good timing, let's go with it. You know, we talked about how they missed the boat in 2021 when Reddit first filed confidentially, at least. For, for a listing. So that there is always an investor appetite and enthusiasm. I would say, you know, that take that 8% of shares that will go to Redditors, there's no lockup or restriction on those. They'll be able to sell on the day. So I think it's gonna be one of these really interesting ones where you put more emphasis on what happens in the moment. You know, everyone will say, oh, I'm a long-term shareholder. I hold on to the stock. But actually, I'm interested to see what day one trading's like and what the sentiment around Reddit is, because I think there's a lot of doubt out there about its ability to grow and ever become profitable, uh, irrespective of, of what it does for confidence and sentiment for a US technology IPO window in the first half of this year. And let's talk about TikTok quick. I'm looking at yeah. Wednesday to see if the House actually passes this legislation. Yeah. What are you looking at in the tech world in San Francisco? I'm looking at who buys TikTok. OK, so if you proceed on the basis that the, the bill goes through and, and the only way for the platform to continue operating in this country uh, is for it to be sold, who buys it, right? I think John mentioned earlier, well, let's take a hypothetical of Microsoft buying it. Do we really think that Meta would allow that to happen? Indeed, anyone else, right? There's a real antitrust question with that. Um, but also, you know, th there's one thing that we cover on Bloomberg Technology that many people don't talk about, which is the sheer user base in America. A lot of people use TikTok and they really like it. And so its position at the center of this presidential race in November, I find really interesting because there are people who are of voting age that love TikTok and might say, well, stop going after it. I don't want the risk of it ever leaving my, my smartphone, doom scroll, whatever. I wonder if we get the Oracle Walmart comeback. I'd be interested to see if that happens again. Ed, it's great to catch up, sir. Ed Ludlow of Bloomberg is going to guide you through some of these issues a little bit later on this morning on Bloomberg Technology. Just to tease the day ahead, tomorrow, this is the lineup for you. Neela Richardson of ADP, Mira Panda of JP Morgan, Stuart Kaiser of City, Steve Rusciuto of Mizuho. The last time we spoke to Steve, Steve was talking about no rate cuts, Lisa, in 2024. And we heard that just recently from uh, Aditya Bahave, also just talking about how... It's not likely, but it's looking more 
like a possibility given some of the strong data. Steve's big point was that he's really looking more towards fiscal policy than monetary policy. And where things stand right now, he just didn't see the point of what was needed to do this. So he was in Torsten, Torsten's camp. No cuts. Look, after Friday's data, I think it pushes back some of that conversation. A little bit. It's a setback for the Torsten slots of this world. We're still talking about north of 200,000 jobs. That's a lot I mean, of jobs. It's not nothing. I uh, know. Just to sort of put it into perspective and based on expectations, sure. It's just not 350, <laughs> which is a change. Is that really all that people Tomorrow, is that the threshold? Bramo's going to get an extra hour's sleep, less grumpy. Phew. Is that a promise? <laughs> I don't know, hopefully. <laughs> so is it that obvious? <laughs>